Okay, so let's get started. So today's topic is Tesla's strength and weaknesses. Obviously, we can see that the Tesla stock has been kind of in this flat doldrum period. It kind of bounces around in a certain uh, you know trading range. Seems to be that people, are, uh, some people are losing conviction in this. So let's just go down the strengths and weaknesses as an investment, as objectively as we can. Let's go through, you know, not you know no. You know, like, uh, obviously, it's not about trading styles and philosophy that we like to do sometimes. It's really just more about let's look th at the stock as objectively as we can in terms of the strengths of the company and the product and the stock and then the weaknesses of the company, the product and the stock. Right. So let's get started with you, Jeff. Why don't you um, kick us off? Yeah, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> Tesla you know, has tremendous you know, technology leadership and in, in where they've decided to participate, you know, and uh, and it's turning into market leadership. It's not just that they have great technology inside of the company. Um, their technology is, you know, as applied to actual vehicles on the road uh, is, you know, many years ahead in terms of their ability to achieve, you know, performance specs at a particular price point. Um, they've got, uh, arguably the best supply chain in, uh, in, in auto. And there's actually objective measures of this too. There's a company called uh, Gartner who does uh, supply chain uh, objective rankings across many vectors. And they've, they've rated Tesla actually the 14th best supply chain in the world, uh, including all kinds of consumer products. And um, they, and, and, and there's no auto company ahead of Tesla on that, they're ranking a 14. The next auto company, I think, was in the 40s, and it was Toyota, which uh, actually makes sense. Tesla, Toyota should be a highly rated. Budget. So supply chain kind of gets a zero today, but I think it's a huge advantage. Their technology leadership I talked about, and um, you know their innovation inside of the company. It's it, it comes out in their product, and you can then equate it to kind of a multi-year advantage. Uh, so that's you know that's enduring. It 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 it's um, it's allowing them to have, you know, best in class in terms of EVs, gross margins, and all, nearly, you know, I would say top tier gross margins in all of auto. Now they used to have the best gross margins and, and obviously that, that changed, but they're obviously they're building superior product that people are paying a premium for. Um, you know, those are definitely strengths of the, of, of the company. Um, you know, and the other thing is they've just, they have, I talked about the supply chain, I talked about product innovation, software. They have their own, you know, unique operating system that's now becoming ubiquitous globally. Uh, you can't, I think you can't think of another automaker who has a, an operating system on a vehicle that, that, it, you know, can land in every country and every major dialect and, and be um, hit the ground running and people know what a Tesla is and, and how to just operate it. Um, obviously, they're, then they have the lead on autonomy that can actually scale, uh, both economically as well as uh, geographically and, and, and scale in, in unit volume and number. Uh, so, I mean, there's just really kind of an endless, you know, there's a pretty big list of, of, of you know, strengths of the company. You know, in terms of, of weaknesses, I think there's a big weakness, you know, around awareness of, of the product. And, and this is measurable. Uh, and like I say, like I have my own like personal an anecdotes, anecdotes, but I think this is something that's quantifiable, it's measurable. I think Tesla should measure awareness uh, on you know two or three vectors. It could be pricing, it could be product availability, it could be pick a third thing, charging or range. Like, but just measure awareness of Tesla of EV and uh, report out on it and report on uh, on on. And knowing how effective, knowing how, how that awareness metric is going will tell you how your messaging is going. If you need to crank up or crank down uh, advertising, messaging, if you have to do it in different regions, different parts. So I think that's a big blind spot for Tesla is not measuring awareness. Remember, I'm not prescribing go run ads. I'm saying measure, quantify the problem, put a metric next to it. So I think that's one of the weaknesses. Um Obviously, a big glaring weakness is, is they don't have, you know, their CEO uh, with a with a compensation package uh, for his prior work or for his new work. Um, 
it's, you know, it's ridiculous. It has to be solved. I think it's a somewhat of a unique situation, but it needs to be remedied pretty quickly. Uh, I think it's weighing on the stock currently. I think it's one of the reasons it's, it's trading sideways is there's tremendous uncertainty. Um, I think another weakness is how they measure, how they manage uh, quarterly earnings and how they communicate on conference calls. And, you know, we can be bold up all we want and say it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. Uh, and, the, you know, institutions buy research and they buy and they listen to the feedback of these firms uh, that are, you know, putting their price targets on the company. And you can say they're all wrong and whatever, that's fine. But, you know, every 90 days, I think Tesla owes, you know, its investors and employees a, a proper readout on, you know, how well the company did and, and how well they're going to be doing going forward. And um, so I think they can do a better job there. But like all the hard stuff, like they're doing, they're not getting out of the park, whether it's technology, innovation, or so forth. So I think that's a sh kind of a short list. I could probably go on for for 20 minutes, but I would start there. Okay, sounds good. I've got a response as well, but I'll wait till after Christian because I know he's going to have, he's going to bring down a hammer. So go ahead, Christian. Let's hear your uh, thinking about strengths and weaknesses. Objective. Yeah. No, I'm not going to bring no hammer. I'm going to be nice and gentle. I, I thought Jeff did a great job at um, talking about um, strengths and weaknesses. I'll just go, uh, I'll start with the weaknesses and then, and then I'll go to the strengths. Um, you know, Jeff hit a lot of them. You know, uh, first I'll go from a stock perspective, why the stock is challenged, and then I'll, I'll go to some more of the, of the management and things of that nature. Tesla's earnings... Uh, year over year is negative. So their forward PE is actually higher than their current PE, which is fine. But that that's just a metric that a lot of investors look at, institutional investors. So the earnings is decreasing again for like the second year. So that there, there's no catalyst there. Um, Cybertruck, which is a great product, the ramp is just slow. It's just painfully slow. I'll think they'll be lucky to do 50K this year. I'm no expert, but I just look at my eyes and from what I see and what what I kind of think is coming out, and it just doesn't look like that's moving. So I think the execution there, even though it's a groundbreaking product, it's not really going super well. Uh, FSD, again, another groundbreaking product, and if they can get it to work, that's great. But we haven't had a lot of updates. We haven't had a lot of talk about, you know, Elon talking about it, and we get some encouraging data, but it's kind of been in no man's land for a while. So, I mean, I just say it's a net negative for now because we see the cars depreciating value. In 2019, Elon said it would be an appreciating asset. And these cars are depreciating rapidly. And I know they're coming off from a high base after COVID, but still the, the car values are plummeting. And if the technology was so great, you would think at some point, either the customers or Tesla itself valuing the technology as such a great technology that it would hold value a little better. That's just my opinion. Again, I'm no expert. Um, I'll say from Jeff's points, which which I've talked about many times, and I've been talking about this for months, I think the communication on conference calls is absolutely terrible. This is a top 10 company in the world. And sometimes when I'm listening to it, I'm literally cringing because I've listened to all the other conference calls from the major companies and they're run so much more professionally. So, um, you know, and, and that matters. And like, if you want a higher stock price and you don't want your stock crashing 10% after every earnings, you know, you might want, you know, I know that they're capable of doing it, but they just, they haven't done it. I think Zach was a big loss to CFO. The new CFO to me is not quite up to the task. Again, that's just my opinion from listening to him the last few calls. He seems very shaky. So I think that's a weakness. Um, I think Elon, which I love him and I love the free speech. I'm a huge free speech adv advocate. I love X. But, you know, to be honest, if you're holding the stock in, in, in a massive position and every day like you're going in and, and you know that like a tweet here or there could knock the price down. If you're not a buyer of, of stock at lower prices and you have most of your money already in, that's a net negative because you're getting hit with unforced errors. Because if I'm holding Amazon or if I'm holding NVIDIA, I'm not worried about my CEO you know, whether he can do it or not is irrelevant. It's just, it's it's hard for me as an investor with limited capital to, to put my money there when it's just going down day after day after day after day. And I'm drawing down when I see NVIDIA up 40, 50%. I see even Google up, you know, 5%. Amazon's up 
Um, Chipotle's up nicely, and those stocks are doing well. And I'm drawing down in Tesla. You know that that's opportunity cost, right? Tesla down 25% year to date. Again, this is short term, and I know you guys are hitting here are a lot of long term investors, and I get it. But I'm just talking short to medium term. There's a lot of opportunity cost being lost when you have like an Nvidia of 40, 50, or even stuff that's up 10, 15%, and you're down 25. That's like a 50%, 60% swing in in return. And those things, if they're happening long enough could, could really hurt you. Now, if you're a long-term investor and you're loving these uh, cheap prices, that's great. You could buy. And if your time horizon is five, 10 years down the road and you believe in the story and it works, you're going to do well. But, you know, we're also talking, you know, on this about, you know, short to medium term stuff. So I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. I'll just say the, for the strengths, Elon Musk is a strength. Um, because of his visionary and what he's accomplished in the past, he could do it again. Um, I think Jeff was right about the overhang. I've talked about that. It's not great when your CEO is talking about wanting a certain percentage of stock to make AI happen, and he doesn't have it right now. So it makes me think, well, is he not going to push AI until he gets it? And when does he get it? I don't know. That's a lot of uncertainty for a stock to handle. And I think we see it in the results year to date. So with all that being said, and I, uh, I probably rambled a little bit, but I hope I made some good points there. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you, Christian. Yeah, and I'll, I'll take my turn, then we'll go to Sat next. Um, so the way I look at Tesla, right, there's the business, the product, and then there's the stock. The reason I'm invested in it is because it's a disruptive technology. So I just published this morning an interview with Larry Goldberg, and he did an amazing full review of what disruptive technology is all about. And he had a great line in, in both his long-form tweet that he did, but also his the video where he said that, you know, you do not look at spreadsheets if you're looking at disruptive technology. Um, and Tesla, that is what, that's why I'm invested in them, right? There's a, a change from uh, ICE cars to EVs. They've knocked that out of the park, out of the park, beyond our wildest dreams of what we expected, where we'd be today in terms of the adoption of electric vehicles, in terms of uh, the change in the in the industry, the products that Tesla has created from the Roadster, the Model S, the Model 3, and now the compact car and Cybertruck. It's through the roof, best vehicles in the world. Uh, people are loving electric vehicles, and that's happening. When you see a disruptive technology, you don't necessarily see the earnings fall at, uh, when you want it to come. And so we're frustrated watching this, you know, the earnings, and we're watching the Tesla stock go sideways, in fact, fall significantly. But when you see a disruptive technology, what happens is the business model kicks in, the legacy industry just just it gets destroyed very, very quickly. It's going to seem slow, which is what we're at right now. We're at that stage where every year we're thinking it should have happened this year, should have happened this year, but it's not. And so that's why we're kind of suffering in a sense that we're waiting for the stock to happen. But when it happens, you will see everything that Tesla has done in terms of their business model, right? Not requiring a dealership, having their insurance, working on FSD, all of these things will kick into place at some point. And when it does, things will change dramatically, right? So one you have to think of this company as that, a disruptive technology. What does that mean? It's an entire business model that is completely changing the game. And so you don't consider this as a car company, right? It is a software company and happens to have a robotic company with you know wheels and all that that he talks about. We don't see it in the numbers right now. So their effort as a, as a in disruptive technology and an innovation company, they're kicking it out of the park, right? They have the largest supercomputers in the world. They're working on Dojo. They have uh, they have now made significant improvements in FSD version 12. They're, they're right up there in terms of AI skills and, and talent. Of course, energy has finally this year shown in terms of revenue and profitability, and it's now coming to fruition. Um, everything that's happening now, we are all kind of, you know, obviously, our, as, as, as people who are following this company so closely, we see the delay in semi, uh, Tesla semi, over a year delay. We've seen the Cybertruck being delayed, where some people believe it's delayed, right? Some They're claiming it is. 4680, there was promises of what they said it would happen and when it would happen, and it has been delayed. Um, you know, the, these things like solar, Giga Mexico. But when you step back and realize why these things are delayed, right, these are you know, technology leaps 
in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. At least they're doing these kinds of massive moves for 4680s to try to really bring the cost down, to bring the prof profitability, you know, efficiency and all that. These things take time and they're delayed. But again, what other companies doing these things and when will it come in, right? So in terms of weaknesses, absolutely, the biggest issue is communication. Here's a company that is so focused on just product and, and building and creating stuff, but they don't communicate it well. And that's the challenge, right? That's why there's people like us that are here because we're trying to help the company communicate this better. They certainly don't do that well. I do think that Elon is a net net positive. Um, at the end of the day, he's absolutely important for the company, of course, and he's uh, delivering positive things. He's not helping the company. He's not here trying to boost the stock up. At the end of the day, I don't think that that's his role. He shouldn't be talking about the stock. And at some point, his actions actually, uh, you know, it's just, he's done enough of it that I don't know if it actually will damage the stock even more than, you know, what, what some people claim it has already at this point, right? But the, the other thing I've been very um, kind of hoping that Tesla will do better right now is communicating that they're a robotics AI company. And I'm still believing that uh, he knows that that's important. He's been using those words recently. Um, and, and they're certainly hiring all the right people. They're making moves in both FSD and the bot. The movement in the bots is just mind-blowing, by the way. I mean, all, if you step back and you don't look at the stock, if you don't even look at the stock at all, you've got to tell me this company is just amazingly producing amazing things in, in, in some ways faster than you realize, right? The bot has, has, has screened past all the, our time frames of what we think it would happen. Um, and so, so you know, the, I, the one thing that is damaging was, you know, a year ago, I remember Christian was, we were all, talk, you know, laughing and joking that this was an earnings machine. Tesla's an earnings machine, 30% margins, you know, sales because of the supply uh, COVID hit and the, the funding and everything that, that all crashed because of macro, right? And that's what hit this year, this year. But step back, look at the product, look at the company. They're knocking out of the park at all these places. So I do want them to have more funding on AI. I think that this is a war. They need to make, you know, make big moves. You see here, Sam Altman, uh, we don't know if this is true or not, but he's, there's, there's reports that he's uh, raising $7 trillion. Obviously, we're all you know fascinated in watching NVIDIA. Many Tesla investors are jumping ship to NVIDIA. That money flow is being documented and being seen as happening. So you know this AI boom is real. And the question is, when does Tesla step up and show that they are at, that thinking as big? And we know Elon is thinking bigger than these guys. So I have no doubts that this is going to happen. But right now, we're sitting at the moment where we don't even know if they're doing this or not. There's that uncertainty. And of course, like you said, Elon compensation thing, that is just a lawsuit that happened, caused a lot of this, you know, disruption and a lot of uncertainty. And that's certainly another big, you know, drag to the stock. So I look at it from company and product. And when I do that, everything's looking fantastic. I mean, net net, right? There's all, I can name you seven or eight things that have been delayed, which I just listed a few out. But at the end of the day, I'm very happy and proud of this company. And they're showing that they're an innovation company. So it will all come together in a, a great business model that's going to just eventually just show it's over. It's like in, they, they will win market share as big as they want. It's just very much delayed. So let me pause there. Oh, Gary's here as well. Uh, why don't you go uh, get talking, Sat, while I bring Gary up? Thanks, Everett. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. I, uh, some of the weaknesses, I'm going to go with weaknesses first. Uh, I'm going to take a different angle because I don't want to repeat what everyone else is saying because uh, they're all valid points. I just want to give a more historic uh, picture because I've been noticing a lot of criticism with Tesla and Elon. And that uh, I think one of the weaknesses is unfortunate because Tesla sets the standard and they have to give the roadmap out by doing battery day and AI day to recruit people for something nobody's ever done before. So they have to do these recruitment days that un inevitably shows the product uh, strategy down the line. No other company is basically doing that. They're doing a product that's going to come out within the next couple of years or something in terms of unveiling, but they don't have these massive events to recruit people for Optimus or for uh, Dojo or, or for Battery Day. So I think that's a weakness in that sense because they're the most innovative. And I think it's it sets a standard also even with their 
their business model and then their gross margins, you know, was in the 25%, uh, 22% area. And so the market doesn't like it when it goes continually down, even though at 17%, it's still industry leading for a mass producing uh, vehicle company, right? So I, I think there's an unfair uh, lens that's put on because of the standard that they put on. Right. And when Apple's growth was there for the iPhone quarter after quarter, they were low ball at every single quarter and they'd meet every single numbers on a steady pace. So nobody got mad and everyone was happy. And I think that's not possible when you're trying to do something that's very different or nobody's ever done. And that's why you have delays. The 4680 is delayed or certain products are delayed or semi is delayed. Right. And uh, it comes back to the battery constraint. Right. And then you're in between two platforms right now. Uh, the major platforms, the Gen 3 platform and then the 3 and the Y. And so when you have these in between, you don't have anything that's concrete that's going to bring in massive revenue or growth every single quarter that the market will be happy about, right? So it there's a, there's a certain section of like this innovation that uh, Tesla is doing that is seen as a weakness because you don't have the consistency and the market loves the consistency. And uh the business, I think, is the strength of it. Uh, and I think, you know, the earnings call, I mean, I'm, I'm, I am I'm, know what Christian said, but I, I feel like Ford, I listened to Ford's earnings call, they all skip around the major issues that they were facing. And so everyone's happy. And then they gear towards the stock. They manage the company for the stock and not for the business. So they'll rescind or cancel their EV programs, which is the future of automotive and make sure they meet the numbers for this quarter or next quarter. And that's why everyone's happy and nobody's mad at the CEO, uh, even though he lied, right? They, all the CEOs have lied on the other legacy side. Nobody points that out. They all rescinded or stopped the production <laughs> or modified it significantly from what they promised before uh, years ago, right? So considering that Tesla's done delays but they've executed on mo most of the stuff rather than just giving up and saying hey we're going to go back and, re and retract uh i think there's that difference and this the strength that tesla has that elon has always mentioned is the rate of innovation and no other company has that and he's proving it even with the optimus bot right within 18 months so i think that part's overlooked and you can't they quantify that into the stock because the way the market financial modeling works, you can't do a uh, rate of innovation as part of your financial model because it's not real numbers yet. Yeah. Thank you, Sat. Uh, welcome, Gary. So what the question we're asking is, uh, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of both uh, Tesla's business, right? The product and the business and the company, and, and then also the strengths and weaknesses of the stock. Yeah, thanks for uh, asking me to join. Um, I've been listening the last couple minutes. I don't think the stock price being down has anything to do with the delays in tech, 4680, the semi, solar. I don't think that has anything to do with it. What's driving the stock price lower is deteriorating fundamentals. It's not about communications. It's not about his political tweets. It's really because you've had the self-imposed damage to earnings and, of course, the market cap and the lack of financial discipline because they keep taking down prices in excess of, of the COGS declines. And that's why earnings estimates are down 46% for 2024. They're down 50% for 2025. And when, when investors see earnings estimates decline, they take the stock price. That's why the stock price is down. It's not because of delays to you know, innovation or technology. That's just, that's just bogus. You're giving Elon an out. That's not it. It's all self-imposed damage because they cut prices in excess of cause, and that's cogs, and that's why the stock's getting crushed. And, you know, investors like me and other institutions, we look at it as deteriorating fundamentals. And I was trying to point out to somebody today how this is different from 2019 when the sentiment was very bad. You know, you think back to 2019, and I owned Tesla back then. You buy a Tesla, it would take you 8 to 12 weeks to get your Tesla. Now it's 1 to 2 weeks. Um, they were raising prices. They weren't cutting prices. Estimates, I looked at the 2019 period from January to December. Estimates actually went up. Uh, and, of course, the short interest was much higher then. So it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that the stock's been getting crushed because when you take estimates down, the stock price goes down. Yeah, I, um, I, I mean, I agree with that, obviously. But I think that the street... Um, was wrong in Q4 uh, with where they 
where they guessed on gross margins and Tesla beat it. The problem, the reason it's down is they didn't guide. They didn't tell you like they, when companies don't guide, that sends a, you know, a concerning message, whether you're Apple or whether you're, whether you're Tesla. But if you actually look at what they're doing, like if you look January 1st to today, February 13th, I, I can, I have great confidence that, that right now that they're, um, if they continue on their COGS reduction effort, even their average, not even their best core, just taking their average, that they're they're ahead of it right now, uh, and 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 they're ahead of price declines for the quarter. So I, I think there's actually a, a there's a forecasting problem um, on the street, but you can't deny what Gary's saying about 2022, 2023, and the EPS, and then the projections for 2024. And the EPS erosion. I'm just saying that I think they're, they've turned the ship. It's, it's been a very long process to turn it over the last year, and I think they are actually. I think they're going to steady gross margins here. And again, unless something catastrophic happens, I think they've they've steadied the ship. Look, if, if gross margins have bottomed, and you're right, fourth quarter was up from third quarter, and that was good. But you've seen these continual price declines, and we just saw one, I guess, the other night where they're taking Model Y down by $1,000 for a month. And then they're going to, Elon says, well, then we're going to bring it back up. You know, most, again, institutional investors are very skeptical of that because, you know, th that just looks kind of hokey. Like, why would you announce a price cut for a month and then bring it back up? And he, and, he, and his, his logic, which, again, many of us were discussing this today, was because people don't buy EVs at this time of year. Well, we know that that's a seasonal fact that we know that, you know, uh, September through November is strong. We know that March through June, once people get their income tax checks back, are usually strong. But you don't take prices down for a month and then bring them back up or you're training the consumer to wait for promotion. So it's it's not even to your point. We, we see COGS declines. You're right. But it's not even that the amount of price decline that's seen. It's just people expect that this is going to continue. And Elon, rather than be honest with people and say, well, you know, we have more um, quantity being supplied than we have orders. Rather than say that or say nothing, right? He makes up an excuse and say, "Well, this time of year, people don't buy EVs." And it just it when when you're an institution, it's all about credibility. And then when people build their models, they don't just build in a thousand dollars for this quarter on Model Y. They build in a thousand dollars for the next couple quarters. And so there's a lot of skepticism because of what happened last year with the price declines being, I think, 20% year over year, that there's just going to be more and more of these every time the um, uh, the production is, is ahead of the orders. So I'm I'm very skeptical of this, and, and I'm telling you, that's why this it's not because of delays with all the innovation. It's because the estimate cuts are now, you know, 46% for 2024 um, over the last year. And when estimates go down, stock prices go down. And that's why the stock is down. It's not because of delays in the innovation. Okay. So wait, I, I agree. Wait. I would just add real quick. I also think, yes, of course, you know, we have the forward earnings higher than, you know, because the earnings are just coming down, which is making the multiple on, on a four basis actually going up. But I think even bigger is the unit growth now. Even with all these price cuts, remember when Tesla said 50%? you know, compounded growth. I know it, it's over a period of time every year, but this year looking like, you know, they're lucky maybe to do 15%, right? And we're talking about 2 million, 2.1, 2 .1, 2 .2 million units. You know, I'm being generous with the 2.2. .2. I think it's going to be closer to, you know, between 2 and 2.1 2 with, with, with prices being slashed over the last year. And when you have that reduction in growth of units, you know, that is, you know, I don't know how they're going to get to that 20 million in 2030, which I know most people didn't believe, but now it, that looks like like it's almost an impossibility unless this next gen, car, you know, comes out and, uh, you know, but I just, you know, that's going to take time. And I think if you ask most bulls in 2024 that Tesla would do 2 million, they would laugh at you because the trajectory they were going and, and the EV and, and all that and the way they were hitting it, if you would have said 2 million units flat in 24, you know, most bulls had, I, I heard crazy amounts. I mean, I heard, you know, 6 million, 5 million, 4. I, I heard that as commonplace you know, a couple of years ago. And now that we're seeing it 2 million flat in 24, that's major de deceleration in growth. Yeah, but I think yeah, that yeah. that's that's from that's from extreme people that are thinking and kind of 
an extreme way. But I, I go back to this is a positioning issue. This is first off, if Tesla if Tesla came on the earnings call and said, "Look, we're going to grow somewhere between ten. We're not entirely sure, but there's more variation. But we think we're going to grow somewhere in between ten and twenty percent revenue growth this year." And that's going to put us in the top half of the of the magnificent seven stocks in terms of uh, revenue growth, and in terms of our 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 our, uh, our EPS regimen, we're going we're going to align pricing with our Cogs reduction program more closely than we have in the past. And I think if they would have said that, there's no guarantees on either of those statements. But I think if they would have said that, it would have positioned the conversation completely differently. Uh can I-, I disagree with that. I disagree with that because remember, Tesla trades at a 60 multiple, the rest of the mag seven trades at a 30 multiple. So if you're growing at, let's say what you said, 10 to 20%, but all the other ones are growing at, you know, let's say 10 to 15%, the multiple is going down. I don't think that would have done anything. I think most people got to what Christian said is that um, volume this year is going to be up about 15%. And more importantly, people are taking their 2030 volumes down because you're right. Elon was saying 20 million. You're not even going to get to 10 million now. So you got the, the the terrible combination of you got volumes getting going down in the estimates. You got pricing going down in the estimates. Most people are, are holding uh, gross margins steady for 2024. But the challenge right now is there's there's not much growth and you're tightening pricing down. And think about it, nobody's really mentioned this. You got a $7,500 EV credit on Model Y that started January 1st, and you're still not getting much volume growth. So I just look at it as, you know, the the people who bought EVs back the last, you know, say 2019, they were the early adopters. They were focused on, you know, being green, climate change and all that. That was word of mouth. So what I call the rational pragmatists who are buying EVs now, they need to be shown why. They need to be told, Here's why an EV is better than an ICE vehicle, and Tesla's not doing that. So in order to get 50% growth, you got to recognize that the people buying EVs today are very different than the people buying EVs back in 2019. But I, I, I'm not going to debate the, the uh, advertising. I think if, if you're on the call, I think we should be getting that data, Gary, in terms of awareness, and Tesla should be reporting on that quarterly. But how do we know the, the volume's not growing? They installed 30% more capacity year over year and there's reports out of text i mean that's a fact that's not a that's not a worse surmising they they, they said they they installed 30 percent more capacity so they're trying to fill it up and use it so i i, I don't know how we're saying that volume's not growing and it looks like texas is outputting this is this is a report this isn't confirmed but yeah. double their run rate from the prior quarter but you're talking production not deliveries and if you follow somebody like troy who i think has been very good at predicting um, deliveries, he's closer to 2 million than 2 1. And so, look, when you see prices coming down and they're constantly discounting, that's a sign that demand's not keeping up with production. There's no other way to interpret that. Otherwise, they would be raising prices. But they're, but they're increasing production. I understand that there's a, there's extremes, right? You have, you have, <clears throat> you've got legacy auto trading at single digit multiples and not growing. I got it. You don't want to be anywhere near that. They're growing. They're in a segment. They're they're arguably be behind AI. EVs are are growing at a at a you know at a at a pretty solid pace. And they're they're adding capacity and they're filling it up. I get it. It's not maybe it's not good enough for a fifty or sixty multiple. But I think the multiple question is a whole other call of like what really defines the multiple. Is it truly just doing a math equation? We can just like go in the phone book and pick stocks, or is it looking f- ahead in the twenty twenty five? as well and what their potential um you know potential upside is what some of their catalysts okay well you know multiple is not based on industry multiple is based on future growth rate that's mathematics okay that's financial theory so if you tell me that a, you are of 100 percent certainty that a company is going to grow earnings at say 35 to 40 percent a year i can put it with a pretty high degree of confidence say it's going to trade at a 50 to 60 multiple if you tell me it's going to grow at you know five ten percent i could say It'll trade at a 15 multiple, but it's math. It's not. It's not emotion. PEs are not based on emotion. They're based on what, whatever the forecasted growth rate is, and it's not based on the industry in which they compete. So everybody gets all caught up. Is is a tech company? Is an AI? That's not really important. But if people believe that the earnings growth is going to be 35 to 40 percent, you can put a 60 multiple on Tesla. The problem is people are starting not to believe that. That's the challenge. Yep. Agreed. 
And, and I agree. And I, I think multiples also, I come from a little um, different spot on it. Like multiples, it, it, it's not an exact science. It's an art, right? In that multiple, there probably is some robo taxis, you know, people believing that and are buying, right? Maybe not institute, but retail. Bot, bot is way in the future. But if it happens, you know, some of that can be embedded in the valuation. So, you know, I'm not as, I you know that that probably is occurring. Now, what to what degree, you know, no one knows, but I, I think Tesla gets that outsized multiple because these option plays. So I think that is incorporated in it. But but Gary's right. Like you, you can't have earnings going down and it doesn't get me excited to buy the stock when I know the earnings year over year are going down and they've been going down. You know, growth is is really slowing. And I get this point, but, you know, when you're trading at a high level, it's like, do you really want to go there when you have these other companies that like, you know, the Googles of the world that's trading, you know, 22 forward and, and have a consistent, you know, buyback and, and things of that nature. I know Tesla investors kind of different, but from the institutional side, they're going to money's going to come out of Tesla and go into these other names because they are more predictable. The CEO is much more predictable. And, you know, Tesla's kind of just languishing in here um, year to date. So, you know, it's a great conversation so far. Everybody's making great points. But, you know, I think something needs to change because there's going to be, yes, two, like a year or maybe two years. I don't think that next generation vehicle is coming out till 26. OK, I know everyone, you know, last time we did this one, it was a end of 20. None of that's happening. That these things take a lot of time, you know, late 25, 26 to get real production. So I, I think you have a period in here if you don't get some demand because you know, I know we hate to say it, and I know you say it. I always said Tesla didn't have a demand problem. They actually have a demand problem now. Just have to cut price to move product. Now, they can produce. I'm not, they have the factories. Tech, you know, the, I think they're over capacitized, to be honest, because they, Elon said, they need to move metal and they need to keep these factories, they need to make cars go out. But if you don't have the demand, you have a problem. So this is where I'm saying, and I don't want to debate this, but I'm just saying it makes sense when you have a little bit of a demand problem. And even some bulls out there are saying now Tesla even has a little bit of a demand problem. You should try at least when you have, I don't know, what is it now? 20 something billion in the bank. Take 100 million, <laughs> take take 50 million, something okay, and enough. try some ads. There, there I, is I, no I don't know why demand, you put it. There is no demand problem. Okay, the growth Herbert, of I don't know how you can say it when you keep cutting price. That, Herbert. How do you say that if they're cutting the, price constantly? Okay, there, that's so when you say there's the demand problem, not the demand problem, you have to be very specific about the segmentation, right? Is there a demand problem for $100,000 cars? Is there a demand problem for a $5,000 car? These things matter, right? So if you're talking about ASPs, you're talking about um, electric vehicles versus ICE vehicles. ICE Electric vehicles has clearly won the game. There is no debate there. Electric vehicles growth has significantly grown. You're comparing it to a 50% growth rate when it's actually at 30% or something and you're going, my God, there's a demand problem. This is accelerating in an exponential curve. There is no issue with that. Now you're talking about Tesla and Tesla cutting prices, meaning therefore there's a demand problem. The 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 issue of the the price, the, the, you guys are concerned about the margins that Tesla is getting as opposed to What's wrong with Tesla selling every car? Like if they if they brought the car down to twenty five thousand dollars, right? Not making any margin at all. Is there a demand problem? No, they'll sell everything that they make. Now you you're saying there's a demand problem for a forty fifty thousand dollar car, which is correct because of the interest rates that we're at today. But in terms of electric vehicles outselling ICE vehicles. That is a proven fact that has already happened in every country in the world. There is no issue. Um, but Her Herbert, can I just correct you? When economists talk about is there a demand problem, they're talking about existing prices. They're not saying if you cut price by if you cut the price of Coca Cola by fifty percent, of course volumes explode. But that's not that's not a that's not a yeah. Discussion. So obviously Tesla is playing in different um, segmentations, right? They do not have a compact car. They've got your Model 3, Model Y. And so those things have clearly already grown to the level where they're hitting their maximum, what they can do each year. That's why the growth, it's not that they flattened. It's not that they're lowering. It's the growth that's slowing down because they've hit their maximum, what they're going to sell. That's what they mean by the Model 3, Model Y is already at the curve. And now you're in between the two curves, right? You're waiting for the model uh, compact car. 
So if you're saying that there's a demand problem for Model 3, Model Y, you're comparing it to what you were expecting, which is a 50% growth next year. There is no demand problem for EVs. EVs has completely won the game. It's a revolution. At the beginning, I talked about disruptive technologies. It's going to be lumpy. And one thing I wanted to ask you, Gary, because we had this conversation before, but maybe you can explain to people here. When I asked you, did you invest in Amazon in 1999 and 2000? You said you did. So 1999, Amazon.bomb, the stock fell, cratered by 100 points because they were not showing margin. They were trying to reinvest everything they made. Now, obviously, we know the whole story of what happened to Amazon, and you don't even have to wait 15, 20, 30 years later to see the story. It actually recovered two years later. And here's the, I'm going to read you a list of what the learnings were that they said. First mover advantage is real and does matter, especially uh, so for new market niches in the new large growing markets. There's always going to be competitors, both real and imagined, for any large and successful business. The potential large competitors are often distracted by their core business. The smaller competitors are often not well financed or large enough to compete. For early successful companies, moves into new lines of business are seen as taking steps to mask slowing growth. And investments at lower gross margins are viewed skeptically. Yet these were both critical to Amazon. Amazon wasn't only successful because of a charismatic CEO. That charisma, charisma belied a very smart approach Amazon took to an exciting new niche of e-commerce. This is what they say afterwards in terms of recognizing a disruptive tech. Investors don't see it as a disruptive tech. And this is the fallacy that I've been listening to for the last 30 minutes here. We're all falling into this trap of Tell me what the growth is this year, what the margins are, why are they cutting prices? This is why the stock is down. All of that is true. All of that is true. So you're correct. But you're also, you can't take what you've heard this year to carry it forward to in, in, in perpetuity until 2030. Things will change very, very quickly in a year uh, because the business model, the technology, the innovation that they're doing is working and it's going to show up very dramatically, very quickly when the legacy incumbent businesses fail and you already see the signs. What you should be talking about is not why Tesla is slowing its growth and why they're reducing their margins by one or two percentage. You should be talking about what's going on with the legacy. And what was shocking was last week, Gary, you were like talking about how great Ford and GMs are when you took a look at their financials that they report because they are forward, you know, projecting forward um, higher uh, expectations and their their forecast, right, uh, is higher than than what we all expected. So you were going, they're not they're not slowing down. These are all masked by a bunch of reasons why. You got to look at the cash flow. The cat, even Jeff Bezos has said, none of these metrics matter except for cash flow. That's what you got to look at because that's the true measure. The rest are are hidden by financial accounting kind of voodoo that they do to it. First of all, Herbert, that's bullshit. I was not saying you should buy Ford or that I like Ford. I was just saying relative to expectations, it did a good job. I have no interest in a company that's shrinking and we would never even own or even look at a Ford or a GM. So that's total BS, what you just said. Second, stock prices are driven by relative to expectations. So if people expect that, let's say, earnings are going to grow at 30 to 35 percent, and they only grow at 30 percent, especially with a high multiple stock, the stock price going down. And that's how we started this conversation is, why is Tesla's stock doing so, so poorly? Why is the sentiment so bad? And my point is it has nothing to do with delays in technology. That's not what institutions will tell you if you talk to them. They will tell you it's because they keep taking prices down in excess of COGS and, and in less margins stabilize earnings estimates, which you can call up on you know, Yahoo, you can call up on Bloomberg, and you can see them. They're down almost 50% year over year. You can't, you can't have the stock price go up, I'm sorry, if estimates go down by 50%. And the reason is because you're cutting price in excess of, of, of COGS, but you're not getting any volume growth. So it just comes across as, you know, why are they destroying the company's margins? Why are they destroying their earnings? And why are they destroying market cap if you're not getting volumes? If you could get volume growth, everybody would be fine of it. But it's not, that's not happening. So don't, don't characterize that I like Ford. I, I have zero interest in Ford. We've never owned it. I've never owned that stock in my life, nor would I, because it's a piece of shit company. They just happen to be beating expectations. But that doesn't mean I like it.
No, I apologize for that because I know you didn't. You, I didn't mean it to say that way. And you did say that you invested in Amazon. So that's. I mean, I know that yeah, you I, understand I like the differences. Amazon. I like yeah. Amazon back when when everybody hated it, just like I liked Apple when they launched iPhone, and it seemed to me like it was a it was a disruptive technology. I compare Tesla more to iPhone. If you read my bullish comments, and that's what I tell people, iPhone was de definitely something disruptive at the time versus BlackBerry and Motorola. And, um, you know, the other products at the time that were out there, that's what Tesla is today. It's not, you know, it's a, it's a great product, but you got to, and, and so there's no, there's no ambiguity about that, but you got to look at, if you're trying to figure out stock price behavior, you have to look at estimates versus, you know, what, what growth versus expectations. And if estimates are going down, which they are Tesla, the stock price can't go up until the estimates turn around. Why, why are we mixing forward and, and like, uh, I guess last what happened last year, like they've already printed a quarter with sequentially improving gross margins. Why are we saying that they're continuing to reduce price and and ahead of cogs? The stock prices look forward, not backward. That's already in the stock. The fourth, I know the, the fourth because the fourth quarter margin prints already in the stock. The, what what right. people are worried about now is with with the lack of discipline that you saw last year is there going to continue to be a lack of discipline that you've seen so far this year first you know from january on you've seen price reductions in china in europe uh canada and you see model y being discounted for a month okay that's a lack of financial discipline that's the way people like me read into it unless you can you can show that cogs are going down at an equal amount and we won't know till the end of the first quarter whether that's true and what what the market is seeing is elon make up excuses of well, people don't buy EVs at this time of year. Well, duh, that's true, but that's that's in the seasonality numbers. Everybody knows that. Um, so that's not a reason you take prices down for a month. So I think it just looks like a lack of financial discipline when they cut prices by $1,000 for a month and then say, well, we're going to bring them back up. It just makes people say, okay, what pricing should I put in for the rest of the year, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, and then in perpetuity? Because if you just took prices down by $1,000, I have to build that in as a, you know, whatever that is. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a huge number. It's, it's 400, it's 450,000 units for the year times a thousand bucks. That'd be $450 million I have to cut for this year. And if you cut it in perpetuity, it's a huge hit to value, right? But I, I'm giving, I'm giving Tesla the benefit of the doubt and I'm taking Elon at his word that come March, they'll take the price back up. But I have no idea if that's true. He may keep the price down. He may cut it another $2,000. And so the reason it's important is because last year he kept cutting price. And if he keeps cutting price this year, the stock's going lower. I know, I but I mean, this is the point I made. But the last quarter, the, the last quarter, COG's decline was well in advance of that. So that, that to me should be current state of the company. And if you look at the pattern of the price reductions that are occurring, they're, they're continue to be very small at the regional trim level. So I don't know why analysts can't like look at that math and say, all right, for the last four quarters, they've cut COGS on average 200 basis points a quarter. And it looks like prices are coming down, you know, maybe a hundred, uh, 120. So they're gonna continue. I, I don't know why that can't be. I know, I, I agree, Tesla should have said that. And that's part of the problem. But I don't, I don't, I mean, it, it, to me, it looks like they're continuing to do what they've done for the last, you know, quarter. And they're going to, to me, it looks like they're going to be able to print improved cogs. Now, the Cybertruck may be a, a huge factor in that. But I also view this, doing this intra-quarter cut and then raising it back, I, I think it helps actually condition consumers to not wait for the third month to buy a vehicle. Because I think that has been the conditioning problem that Tesla has put onto consumers and onto themselves because they're trying to get rid of that third month delivery wave. And just for people to understand, from a COGS perspective, that's a disaster. If you're doing 50% of your volume in the third month, you're expediting everything inbound, you're expediting everything outbound, and those costs are ginor they're gigantic. So the fact to me that they're doing that reduction in the middle of the quarter and saying March 1st, it's going up. I actually think it's gonna drive the, the behavior they want, which is get your orders in, take delivery by the end of the month. Otherwise you're gonna be paying more, you know, 30 days from now. 
Yeah, Jeff, I agree with you, and and I know you're an expert, and you're amazing on on this on the supply chain. But like, like so when you say, um, why why is it so hard? I think it's hard because it wasn't communicated greatly. So if Tesla would have went through on the conference call here, like here's what we're going to do on Cox, like like in this range, you can't be exact, but it it was kind of fumbled a little bit. I know some came over and they tried to make it better, but if Elon or the team could have agreed to say permitted to say this is this is where price is going to be and here's where our cogs will be then you can maybe jump to that and maybe that will happen but when you're in a dynamic stock and it's trading every day and you see these little price cuts i think it was for two weeks and it ended at the end of february unless they don't something like that it just makes questions right and people they don't want uncertainty so to expect investors to understand cogs which is a very you know complicated thing to most people they're just not sophisticated enough to understand here's the cogs reduction and here's what we're going to do over the next couple of quarters so rest assured we are going to to grow you know, profit per volume don't worry about it that really wasn't communicated and even if it's going to happen it's very hard for the individual investor institution to really understand that that conference call so I'm just giving you some call. I think maybe uh, is not interpreted that way. Right. I said that. I agree with that. I said that. I, I, I expect institutions and analysts to know this, but I agree for the common investor. And I totally and they didn't say it. So I, 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 I totally agree with that. I just think there's a fundamental difference in goal of those financial analysts and the market wanting to look at the financial numbers and the financial and put it into the financial modeling versus someone running a business. And I think there's two two different things. And I'm glad Elon doesn't focus on the stock. You see Ford CEO clearly focuses on the short term of the stock. They want to make sure they hit all the numbers of ex expectation. And then the guidance is always lower expectation for them. And so it's not going to be that hard to hit it when you cancel an entire EV program that costs $6 billion per, per, per program. They, they're negative 98% margin. Their gross margin negative 98. So basically they lose the entire price of the car for every EV they sell. So none of the other legacy OEMs are able to make a successful program, right? So I don't see that uh, Tesla uh, have a lack of uh, discipline in their finances. It's the most efficient in uses of the capital expenditures. So it's just that Yes, the multiples are a triple that of the other legacy ex expectations there, the technology there. So interim, yes, absolutely. It's going to get earnings are getting crushed. So the stock is going to reflect it, but they can't see it from a business perspective. It's sustaining. Even if you're even if I take your points of saying production didn't grow, at least they're maintaining it. And I, I listened to Jeff even like if you cut cut off supply, just like, you know, stop it and then turn it back on. You can't just flip it like a light switch, right? So sustaining that, even that production is more important than to try to hit a number and then have like massive deliveries at the end of the quarter, all this other stuff that they were doing that was chaotic. It was chaos every single quarter, end of the quarter. So they're smoothing that out. So I think they're actually getting better at their business production and focusing on the business. And it's in between two major platforms. This has repeated itself. On the Model S and X, when it peaked around 100, 200,000 units, uh, both of them combined, and to the uh, production hall of Model 3, it tanked. The stock was down for four years. I would live through that whole four years. We're going through another period like that, and whenever Gen, Gen 3 is coming out, whether it's a year or two delayed, it's going to come. But until then, you guys are absolutely right. The number's going to get crushed, or it's going to go up and down, and then Tesla's going to have to do price adjustments just like the dealers do. So I just think that the business part is priority, and that's why you're going to see this part where it's not going to reflect that well on the financials, on the earnings, and and the stock price. Hey, Seth, let me ask you a question. If so, if the capacity, which doesn't always correlate with production, but if Tesla's capacity shown in the fourth quarter earnings deck is 2.35 million, and the demand, let's just call it orders, is only 2.1 million. How do they deal with that, and how should they deal with it in your mind? Because that's that's what an institutional investor is trying to figure out, that the production keeps ramping up, and if it's going to be 2.35 million, which is where the installed capacity is today, how do you how do you, how do do you you reconcile that in your mind? Well, you're not going to put in full shifts for 2.3. You're going to put in the shifts for 2.1. That's one. But is that, like, is that truly gonna... happening? Is that truly happening, that they're – curtailing production to 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 hit the 2.1 or is it going to be you know 22 or 23 which means more price cuts i i know the well, answer to they're that. not like what's the answer? <laughs> the answer is is um 
as long as you're keeping your utilization above 80% of your install capacity, you're going to have not only the best um, utilization in the auto industry, you're going to have really good fixed cost performance. And like, that's how you want to run a factory. You actually don't want to run a factory at 100% utilization because number one, you're going to be bringing people in on overtime. You're going to have lumpy material flow and your cost structure is actually going to deteriorate as you get closer to 100% utilization. So you want a little bit of an air gap and that like best in class is 80, 85% utilization, low side, 70%. I'll tell you, Ford is at 39%. GM is, I think, just under 50%, right around 50%. Stellantis is right at, I think, 56%. So they're hurting, and I get it. They're single-digit multiples. Put them to the side for a minute. But in terms of even electronics industry, if you could get utilization, you know, microelectronics, if you can get utilization in the 80s, like you're going to be kicking ass from a COGS perspective. Uh, you're going to have everything normalized for fixed costs. Everything's going to be in good shape. So I think that's what they're targeting. So when you see the answer, Gary, you see the two, three, five, and let's say they do two, one, they're fine. Okay. Well, that would be good if you, if you can manage to that, because then you take some of the pressure off, you know, Elon trying to cut price to match production versus orders. If, if you know, they can somehow match that, that would be great. Well, well now that's the, that's all like, so like what they tell us, what their actual capacity is is probably changing. Like they'll they'll add capacity probably throughout the year. They may or may not put it in that report. Depends how they call it commissioned, online, installed, not installed, pilot, you know, there's all these things that they can kind of do to kind of um, you know, move around that number. But I think you want to look at the year on year um same point in time and what they show as install capacity because that that's kind of saying what they're actually going to do so when i saw the two three five i in my head i thought two you know two one you know two two <clears throat> and idealistically i was like okay maybe two two to two four but <clears throat> i to me i saw you know you know two one is 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 doable with that install capacity um so anyway that that that's that's how I would view it. But again, they you know, they run Shanghai higher than that number that they show there. So it shows you that they've got burst capacity and upside. But that's when you start getting into overtime. That's when you start getting into, that's where the costs come in. I think what Tesla's really doing now that I've they haven't seen what they've done before is they're really getting super disciplined about running the factory efficiently. And so they're, and I, 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 I think they're going to, with what I see them doing in Berlin and Austin, which are the two biggest factories that are dragging cogs down, um, you know, I, I, I see that as positive headwinds. The negative headwinds are going to be, you know, the slow start of Model 3 in the U.S. and uh, the Cybertruck. So I've got I've got a question for the group, a real question, right? I'm really am trying to understand this. So I think we all kind of agree that communication is one of the weak uh, weak uh, weakness for Tesla. But let's say that in the earnings they actually did give guidance. What number did it need to be? But if they just communicated a lower number, let's say just being very very straightforward, what if they started to communicate better, right? They started to say things uh, that we believe that they should have said, haven't said, give guidance more. What would actually that actually do to the stock if the earnings would still be what it is for next year, right? What is it exactly beyond earning? Like, so you need something more than just communication, right? Yeah, look, if I'm a CEO, yeah. I hate giving guidance. I mean, most CEOs, when I was a CEO of a public trade company, I didn't want to give guidance. And my CFO wanted to because it makes his or her job easier. I think, you know, I talked to Martin uh, Vieco about this. It was his idea, apparently, to start giving guidance, uh, to, to at least give some, to, to, to not give guidance, but to basically say, we're not going to do it for, for fourth quarter. So it's the opposite of what I said. It was his idea not to give any guidance. And I think that was probably something Elon probably welcomed, because then he's not beholden to guidance. He's not beholden to some number, like last year, they were beholden to 1.8 million units. And this year, they're not beholden to any number. So I don't think it matters at this point to your question, Herbert. I mean, at this point, the street is where it is. And the street right now is it, you know, let's call it 2021-ish on volume. And right now for earnings, they're at like 
right below where they were last year. Let's call it 310, 309. And so that becomes the new benchmark. And if they beat that, stock goes up. And if they miss that, the stock goes down. But the street's kind of lazy, right? When you give guidance, the street just goes to where the guidance is anyway. Very few times does an analyst say, okay, they're telling me 2-1, so I'm going to go to 1-9 or I'm going to go to 2-3. They usually settle right where, where the guidance is. And so I, as a stock picker, would prefer no guidance now that it's out there. That, that, first, that first step of withdrawing guidance what kills the stock, to your point, but now that it's there's no guidance, there's no benefit to them adding guidance. And I'm sure Elon's not going to push for it. And I don't think Martin's going to push for it. I think with Zach gone, Martin kind of said, why do I want to give guidance and be holding to some number for the rest of the year? And what about better communication? What What is it that you'd like to do? And what would it better communication do to the stock? Um, look, better communication is good. And I don't know why. They're so poor at communicating. They are. I mean, there's no question in my mind they could do a better job communicating. They don't, you know, they don't put out press releases. They don't comment when somebody in the press gets something wrong and then they want to blame the mainstream media for getting it wrong. So I'm a big fan of at least correcting when when somebody is is off on something and getting out there and, and saying to the press, hey, look, you're wrong about whatever you're concluding, because that would help. But they don't do that. They've, they've long said, we're not going to comment. And, but then they want to blame the mainstream media when, when the story's wrong. And, it's, it's, and I've said this before. It's kind of like a team that never shows up for the game. And, you know, if, if you don't want to show up for the game and play it, then don't complain when, when the media gets something wrong. So I'm a big fan of getting out there with, especially offensively, if you've got something good to say, like about a new product or, you know, some court case that you've won or something, I would get out there proactively to the press and communicate it so that the mainstream media can't misinterpret it. Because we do know, and I agree with this, that people will put Tesla into a headline, and especially if it's negative, they get more clicks. We know that. But I don't buy this argument that a lot of people put up this as well, because they're not paying any ad dollars. Therefore, you know, they're always going to be treated bit badly by the mainstream media. Anybody who knows anything about the media knows that that's not the way it works. But it is the way it works to put Tesla in a headline negatively, you're going to get more clicks. So you got to get out there with your story, either in reaction to something or proactively, and they need to do that better. And I'll, I'll just say real quick for me, and, and this might not have anything to do w with anything, but just for me personally, when, when I listen to a conference call, and I know Elon's a little different in Tesla, you know, they don't care about the stock price. I, I get all that. But if I'm an owner of stock, especially in size, I, I do care about stock price. So Again, I go back to, you know, when I listen to the Amazon conference call, I'm blown away at the professionalism and they might not have the answers all the time, but but they're not like laughing and they're not sometimes cussing like there needs to be some type of etiquette on those calls. Those calls are to to talk to investors and we only do it, you know, once every three months. And I understand maybe they don't care. Maybe Elon doesn't care. That's fine. And maybe you can get away with that when things are going good and sales are rocketing and you're growing 50% or 80% units and earnings are going through the roof. Maybe you get away with it. But when your business is kind of struggling and there's some questions, maybe you tighten it up a little bit and, and try to give a better direct message and, and just Try to make an attempt to to give a great call, at least a professional call, and, and and that would be good for a little bit of confidence and sentiment to your stock. Maybe that that's just my opinion. I may be off base. No, so I, I mean, I get we agree with all that, right? But I'm just saying, you, I, I'm I'm trying to balance that with this idea that well, what really matters is the earnings that we're expecting next year. Does a really well run earnings call? affect the actual earnings numbers next year mm -hmm. it doesn't but it helps build confidence and sentiment for the investors but it doesn't change the earnings next year exactly it won't help the earnings but it can help perception and it can help sentiment maybe a little bit it, it, with a great conference call right i, I don't know i'm just think, making that thing I, I think it's a little thing but i think it's important i think if you're a top company in the world i would i don't know why you want to wouldn't want to give a great professional call that that's what i'm saying Christian's right. I mean, it, it's not about providing guidance. It's just being consistent over time. And I listen to probably 50 to 75 conference calls a quarter. And I listen to Apple. I listen to Microsoft. I listen to Meta. I listen to NVIDIA. I listen to Google. They're all very well scripted and professional. And look, I'm not saying Elon should be scripted, but the professional etiquette on a Tesla call is, you know, so far less than what it is those other companies. And they need to do a better job with consistency of communications, I'll use that word, because it's not it's not giving guidance that 
you know, because a lot of those companies don't give guidance per se, but they're viewed as very professionally run conference calls and they inspire confidence and therefore they lower the beta of the stock, which, you know, helps with the stock price. So I know they don't care about the stock price. At least they say that. But there is a level of professionalism that's lacking, especially since Zach left. I think Zach really was the parent in the room, and he probably got everybody together before the conference calls and said, look, this is what we need to communicate. And they don't do that anymore. Now it's just kind of like a free-for-all, and that's that's not good. Yeah, and I, I agree that a certain level of professionals could be and etiquette could be increased in the to Tesla's earnings call. And I'll, I'll flip the same microscopic uh, you know, critique on earnings on Tesla to Ford or other um, earnings call. Ford and GM, they're all the other OEMs. Nobody asked the hard question why their EVs are negative gross margin and they can't meet the production numbers that they they themselves lowballed at 30K or <laughs> production. They can't meet it. They can't even sell the vehicles now. And it's and, and if they do, it's a negative ninety eight, negative thirty three with Rivian, wherever the negative gross margin is. Nobody asked the hard question. They just go roll roll through it like regular business stuff, all the good numbers. Nobody asked the hard questions. So like during these calls, great, but nobody asked you, asked about the future business. <laughs> that's that's a, that's, the, that's what I find contradictory. Like Tesla gets a lot of heat for earnings. I think they can improve on communication. I agree with that part. I think Ford could answer some hard questions that uh, did not even had to answer. But I think that's yeah, well, a six stock, six multiple stock and a 60 multiple stock because you got to get the guidance and the forecast right if you're a 60 multiple stock. I think a better comparison in Ford to GM versus Tesla is like Rivian. You know, Rivian doesn't make money. And yet, if you listen to a Rivian earnings call, much more professional than a Tesla call. Yeah, and the other yeah, thing is... If, um, if I was just going to add, I was just going to kind of add to this conversation. There's another, there's another topic, which is that they're, they're not really broaching on the call, which is around like the performance and quality of their AI. They have a product that they're selling, that they're making many millions of dollars per quarter on. And there really isn't another company out there right now that's monetizing AI. Again, besides NVIDIA, you put NVIDIA to the side. You look at like the Wall Street Journal article on Microsoft today. They're like, "Hey, this this Microsoft Copilot was in was in beta testing all last year, and we heard you know all these great things and all this buildup. And when it actually got up to consumers in January, it was like this thing's hallucinating. This thing's giving me all kinds of wrong answers. And I don't think Tesla does itself uh, you know a proper service in terms of like the actual quality." of their AI solution. Is it 99.99%? No, uh, but in terms of its performance, if you sit in front of ChatGPT, or if you sit in front of Microsoft Copilot and you sit in front of uh, Tesla FSD, like they're, they're getting it to a point where, you know, it is meaningfully better than anybody else that's shipping an AI product to end consumers. So the, the not telling that story and about like, here's the, Here's a universe of AI products that are shipping, and here's how we're doing. You know, I just I think there's a story there. Are they at the endpoint? No, but they can also talk about their path or trajectory to that endpoint and show today that they've actually got a better performing. When you click, you know, and you turn on FSD beta in your car, I guarantee you you're going to get better performance and more accuracy than you would if you sat in front of ChatGPT and asked it a question. They just don't tell that story for whatever reason. But if you if you were to look at Copilot, which I've used, or uh, Grok, which I've used, and I use Baird as well. I mean, Copilot you can download an app net and use it. Copilot is a much better product than say Grok in terms of accuracy. So Grok's not under Tesla though, but I I agree with you. I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying it does. I mean, it's if you look at the if you if you ask ChatGPT ten things, I mean you're not I mean you're not getting answers ten percent of the your time. 10 out of 10 times that are, I would say that are that are useful. Well, here's maybe here's half a, the time. Here's a question for you. My partner and I were debating this today. Would it behoove Tesla to address what you're saying to have either a tracking stock or a separate stock within Tesla, where Tesla owns you know 90% of it, let's call it, but you put it out there that just reflects the AI business for Tesla. So it reflects uh, RoboTaxi, Optimus, anything that's that's AI related. Would it be better? So that people could see that, so they could put an AI value within Tesla, or is it is that too complex? 
I think it's debatable. Uh, I think it's it's worthy of a conversation. Um, I, I, if you're not going to talk about it, if you're not going to um, like regularly update, like there's a there's a Tesla FSD, there's a Tesla AI uh, X handle. I I can't remember the last time. I mean, maybe someone correct me. They posted to it yesterday, but it doesn't seem like they're regularly updating all their great work and their progress. They're, like. Th these releases are successively getting better. Are there big problems <clears throat> that they still need to solve? Yes, but they're successively getting better on many different metrics, whether it's smoothness, whether it's number of interventions, whatever. But <clears throat> for whatever reason, they're not telling that story. And my only point is, is if you sat in front of ChatGPT or you sat in front of Copilot and you asked it to do a hundred different things, I would say more times than not, you're going to get an unsatisfactory response. But if you sit in a car and you click FSD on, I'm going to say not greater than 99% of the time, you're going to get a satisfactory response. At least in 95%, you're going to get a satisfactory response. And for whatever reason, that story is not being told. And, and look, I agree with that. My, my question is simpler, that if investors aren't putting any value on Tesla AI, which I would argue it's not, it's all EV, energy, and storage, do we care as investors? Do we care... And should we take that and create a separate company underneath Tesla where we can track the uh, robo taxi, you know, SaaS if it becomes, you know, $199 a month or whatever it is, Optimus and any other AI products that Tesla's developing, create a separate company so we can actually put a value on the AI piece of Tesla. Is that worth doing or does that just make things more complex? And it sounds yeah. like you're not sure. Yeah, I totally agree with I, you. I would not do that. I, I think it would make it too complex. Yeah. And plus, you know, you, we kind of know if you, you can kind of do the numbers, you, you've done them, right? the take rate, multiply, you, you, you can do it, right? You don't actually, and basically the robotics company, which started, you know, a couple of years ago or, or exactly what it was, it's basically a startup, you know, robotics company and, and they're working on it. So I, I don't think it would have much value. I think we should remember that Tesla is an engineering company, not a financial engineering company. They're engineering real world products. They're engineering things that work. They're not engineering their company to persuade Wall Street analysts or Wall Street investors that the company is worth something. Um, they're trying to make better products and better services for people and make the world a better place and accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. And um, getting distracted by playing financial games or, you know, and it, sorry, I just have to respond to the point that Rivian's earnings calls are more professional than Tesla's earnings calls. Tesla has had, I guess, unprofessional earnings calls the whole way through and the stock is up, I don't know, something like 15 X from when I first started buying. And, you know, uh, they had unprofessional earnings calls when they rose to 400, they had unprofessional earnings calls when they fell to hundred, they're back to like 180. Um, they're not, they did not design the company and they don't run the company to please wall street analysts. They run the company to make better products, better services, accelerate the transition, et cetera. As they should. I agree, Warren. I, I agree with you, but I'll say one thing. When I listened to the conference calls in 19 and 2020, they, they were much better. Elon was much more focused in his opening statements. They were they were more locked in. So I, I'm not saying it matters, but I listened to their conference calls um, numerous times and over and over again in those years and 2021. W w they're much better with Zach. I, I agree with Gary that, that Zach kind of honed it in, but even Elon. Elon with his opening statements, they were actually very good. They were inspiring. And lately, the opening statements, they're not inspiring. They're very down. They're very um, dismal almost. So, you know, I don't think it matters in the long term, but I, I think Tesla's conference calls have severely deteriorated over the last year. I just have to, you know, Elon talks about Optimus, uh, you know, having no limit and basically changing what it means to be an economy. Um, he talks about that. He didn't talk about that in 19 and 20 or 21 because he didn't have Optimus. So is he negative on the short term state of the the global economy and the, the, the market for vehicles? Yeah, well, because that's what he sees and he's being straight with the audience. If you want him to say, hey, everything's, uh, you know, wonderful and we're going to make 10 times as many cars next year as we made this year when he sees problems in the global economy, high interest rates, for example, 
Um, I think he's just being straight with the audience about that. Um, as far as professionalism, when Zach took the job, everybody said, oh, no, we're, we're, you know, Deepak was better. Now uh, Vibehob's taken the job and everybody's shitting on Vibehob and Vibehob is doing the same job that Zach did before. He's chief accounting officer for I don't know how many years. The guy's doing a fine job. Um, people just shit on whoever they can shit on when they're not happy with the stock price. If the stock price, you know, tripled before, you know, before the next earnings call, then everybody would say how great the earnings call was. I disagree. I don't think anyone's shitting on anyone. I'm listening to the conference call and the CFO sounds clueless. So you could say he's great, he's this or that, but he's clueless and he doesn't know what he's doing. He needs executives over the top of him to tell him what to do because his answer is so ridiculous or, or a non-answer that the other professionals like Drew or ever have to come over the top and try to correct what he's saying. So I believe the CFO is a weakness and you could say it doesn't matter, but I, I think it does. There's also could a you, problem when could you do me a favor, Christian, afterwards, if if you wouldn't mind sending me, you know, which earnings call, because I think he's only been on two, which earnings call the Drew correct vibe hop, because I missed that. The last one. Well, I don't know if it was Drew, a couple of them. I think Jeff told about it. I, I'm just saying I think he's up to the job. I think he should be an interim and I think he should be replaced probably with someone more competent. The other problem, and I agree with your point, your main point, Warren, is that that's not what drives stock prices, good earnings calls or not. I agree with you 100%. It's the product that drives the earnings call. But when Elon, just know from an investor standpoint, when Elon blames macro and everybody else is saying that the macro is pretty strong, it's just, it, it's hard for me as an investor to take him seriously when he's blaming the macro for Tesla missing their volume forecast or having to take prices down because that's, that's just not consistent with what's going on in the economy. The economy is doing just fine, as we learn every day. And when he starts saying it's all driven by macro, I, I just don't believe him because most most people can look at the numbers and say GDP growth is two to three. And if you want to buy interest rates down to get your loan payments, that they could do that instead of cutting prices at a lot, lot less cost. A lot of this is self-imposed. And that's my, my issue that you got you got to have credibility with investors for them to put a more consistent multiple and not, you know, put up such a high risk premium on a stock. And I know he doesn't care about the stock price. I get that. But as an investor, we started this call with why is the sentiment so bad? That's one of the reasons the sentiment is bad. It may not be translating into long term value. You're right. Over the over the long run, it doesn't matter. It's just the product and the offering that matters the most and not the quality of the conference call. I agree with that. I don't think we all agree that macro is wonderful. Interest rates are still high. Interest payment, federal government's interest payments on the debt. He just replied to, was it Wall Street Silver or something? I reposted Wall Street Silver yesterday that interest payments on the debt are now something like a trillion dollars a year um, and going to rise to $3 trillion a year at current pace uh, in 10 years. Um, and I, I can say, you know, boots on the ground like you know my personal life is great i don't have a problem but i'm hearing from an awful lot of people you know insurance rates are up if insurance rates are up then uh you know all of a sudden you have less money um a lot of prices are up we still have inflation you know that and the government can come up with other whatever measures it wants to say everything's wonderful there's a lot of people right now who don't trust the government on pretty much anything and the mainstream media when they tell them oh the macro economy is wonderful I, I hear from a lot of people that the economy is not wonderful, and I don't know how to translate that. And what was it? Weren't there just a bunch of layoffs? Um, I forget whether it was the tech industry, big tech or something, had a bunch of another round of layoffs. Um, I, I don't know how to measure the macro economy. I don't know how to trust the macro economy. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't know where we're going with that. I'm just saying, if you yeah, listen but, to other CEOs on earnings calls, yeah. you don't hear people blaming macro. You hear people owning it, owning a company. And if Elon wants to cut interest rates on auto loans, he can do that rather than cut prices. And it's it's a lot less expensive because, as you know, or may know, with accounting, if you cut the interest rate, it's amortized over that loan. It doesn't all come up up front. So they could do that if they want to. If they want to get interest rates down to 2 to 3% on an auto loan instead of cutting price, they could do that. But they, they don't do that. That's their choice. Well, again, yeah, I, it's not a financial think, engineering company. I, I the fact that... I just want to say it's not it's not a financial engineering company, so they're not going to play games like that. And also, it's not, you know, that Elon does not sound like other CEOs is the reason why we invest in him. We don't invest in other CEOs. We invest in Elon. I'm, I'm look, I'm I'm an all in investor on Tesla and I'm an all investor in Tesla. Primarily, I started because of Elon. Now I'm an all in investor because I see the I think I see the future that Sat and I often talk about. But Sat, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
No, the, the credibility part, I don't see other OEMs, especially Rivian, to be credible because how do you explain losing $6 billion? I think they're on track to losing $4 billion uh, for last year. 2022 was negative $6 billion. Uh, 2023 is probably around $4 billion, somewhere plus or minus. Uh, for the same period in Tesla in 2013, they were negative $370 plus million. The next year, they were negative $70 million. They cut off $300 million off of their burn rate because their production for Model S was very successful at 25.2% gross margin. That's the same uh, uh, time of the age of the the company at 50K production for the guidance that they had. So we, I, don't, I wanna know how Vivian's taking accountability. I don't know how you can, like where's the math and losing 6 billion in, in, in your supply chain? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know how you can do that with 50, 50 K and they're still losing money this, this past year, they can't get to break even after two years of production. So they're not doing a great job of it. So they can have a professional earnings call, but they're not giving me information on why they can't make break even, even after two years on a hundred thousand dollar vehicle. Like I, I don't, because, and it's for me from a designer perspective, because I do design. They designed over engineered and over designed the, the product. So it, it doesn't matter how many cogs you cut down, it's not gonna get there because they overproduced, over managed on something that they shouldn't have over designed on. Yeah, well, I don't think GM or Ford have any credibility if that's what you're referring to, but I don't compare No Rivian. That's... Oh, Rivian? Well, Rivian, look, Rivian is kind of where Tesla was four or five years ago. But to be honest, I'm comparing Tesla to Meta or Nvidia or Palo Alto, when I'm talking about credibility, you know, they're, they're, they're all profitable. They're all growing at, you know, about the same rate. So when I'm thinking about, do I want to own Tesla? It's not versus Rivian. Rivian's kind of in a class of its own. They don't make money. We have two stocks in our portfolio that don't make money and Rivian's one of them. But I am comparing Tesla to a Meta or an NVIDIA or Palo Alto that are very profitable and they're all growing at about 20 to 25% a year. So that's, that's when I mean credibility versus other companies at their life cycle stage. Rivian is still, they don't make money yet. So you can't compare a Tesla versus a Rivian, but I can compare it. No, I'm comparing 2013 Tesla. I'm comparing 2013 Tesla at the same age of the, of, of the company and they're doing a horrible job. And I don't know, and Lucid doing a horrible job too, but losing billions and nobody oh, actually critiques them on them on losing billions on something of such low production it, it's it's ridiculous i can't i don't know how you can lose that much money on we're, such low yeah. production yeah we're short lucid so i agree with you i don't i don't have any and nvidia but the, also the nature of nvidia amd the tech companies they're doing uh, primarily b2b uh business and they're doing microchips so it's that's the only that's the main driver they're doing servers but they're doing b2b so there's a different sector that they're going after into the business segment I think one question, and I would love, uh, you know, to be curious because I know, like I said, a couple of years ago, again, this is just, you know, me throwing it out there. And I know Warren had huge, huge volumes. I understand interest rates have gone up, but the 10 years come down a little bit from, from the peak of 5%. Interest rates have, you know, come off a little bit and, and, and car units, you know, in general are, are doing fine. Would anybody thought with Tesla reducing prices so dramatically, with a 7,500 EV credit coming into play, now point of sale, that Tesla would do 2 million flat in 2024? Is that what everybody thought? Is To my opening salvo, I, you know, there were people saying 4 million, 5 million. I think Warren, at one point, you were saying 18 million by 2024, 2025. Oh, I, I, you know, I might've might heard that wrong. Like, is anyone shocked or are you, is there any disappointment in that, that Tesla can only do 2 million units uh, this cool. year? I I don't agree with you on interest rates. Car dealership just guy posted um, that a lot of there's, that there's even more trouble going on in auto loans. That it's harder and harder to get an auto loan. So maybe the the front line rate is down, but more and more people are having trouble getting a car loan. Um, and then Bradford Ferguson right here. Bradford Ferguson just reported that Giga Texas production is up in the first five weeks of the quarter, like significantly up compared to the two previous uh, quarters. The first five weeks of production that's not quite double but it's you know i think it was what did he say it was 10 to twelve thousand the first two uh in q3 and q4 in the first five weeks and this quarter it's 18 to twenty thousand. so you know there may be something happening that we don't know and you know tesla i don't think tesla guided to two million did they guide to two million or they just didn't give guidance no no they, they, give, no, no, they didn't guide at all yeah, so we don't know but 
But Elon talked about that, Warren. He said in his tweet, we, we got to run the factory and, and we got to, you know, <laughs> we have to push out cars because of, of the factory costs. So, you know, that could mean that prices are going to be dropped because they got to they got to move the metal. So it could be that demand surge. In, but I don't know if demand surge, why you would cut 1000 for a couple of weeks. Like, it seems like, like you hate gimmicks. Elon hates gimmicks. Why would you cut price by 1000 to just go back, you know, two weeks later? That just makes no sense to me. So and to me, I think there there could be a demand problem. But prices just went up in Germany, 2,500 euros on two of the Model Ys and 2,000. Yeah, but in Germany, they're, they're having a terrible time in Germany. Go, that's one of the few companies in Europe where sales are down dramatically. Up over in Europe, Germany, they're actually down. So I don't know why they would raise price in Germany when, when their sales are going down. In Europe. It doesn't make any it's sense. It's the whole of Europe, not Germany. Remember, the factory was closed for two weeks, too, in Berlin, and they just they just cut prices by the same amount, at least on the rear wheel drive in Germany. And now they're increasing, which, again, that's short term. That's very gimmicky. You're, you're playing games with accelerating volumes into the quarter. And to me, that's a very short term way of operating. I don't I don't I don't like that because to me, it's like I don't get the point of why would you just raised prices, I think it was four weeks ago, middle of January in Germany, and now they're cutting it by the same amount? That just makes no sense. I mean, you're, you're I playing think they raised, the, the opposite. I think, I think they just raised prices, and what they've told us in the past is they adjust pricing based on demand that they're seeing, and they're seeing demand, you know, real time, and they're making on-the-fly pricing decisions trying to adapt to the market because they're manufacturing cars. They need to get the cars that they manufacture out. They're not holding them on dealer lots like other, you know, these other car companies will hold 100 days of cars on dealer lots. Tesla's not doing that. But that's Warren, just, they, just that's, cut price, they just cut prices in Germany by the same amount back on January 16th. So they cut prices on the rear-wheel drive. They just raised it by the same, exact same amount four weeks because later. Because it's winter. Right, because because they're adjusting open. prices based on the demand that they're seeing on the ground. And You're describing as if they're playing short-term games. They're matching, they're matching demand. But why couldn't you see that four weeks ago? Because, because they're, Derek, matching, they're, they're looking at the demand on a daily basis, not on a four-weekly uh, basis. They got more. Derek, more com convertible prices go up in the summer and SUV prices go up in the winter. But you know That's that. That's what you every car you know that. You know that going in. You know that February. Why are you asking the question? The rear wheel drive doesn't do well in snow in Northern Europe, and they're getting dumped on in record snow. I know, but JP, they know that. They know that already. That's what I'm saying. Why cut the prices four weeks ago only to raise them last night? That just makes no sense because you're, you're jerking around the consumer, right? You're, you're basically saying to the consumer, hey, I'm going to play games with you. For short term, Aaron, everyone finances cars. Nobody's actually whipping out forty seven thousand dollars in cash. No, They're looking at monthly payments. That's not that's not the point. The point is why you're, at, no, you're talking about the consumer experience. The consumer experience looked at a monthly payment, not the MSRP. No the kidding. Vehicle. No kidding. Seventy five percent of people finance their cars. It, but I'm just saying when you cut the price by twenty five hundred and then you raise it by twenty five hundred, you're back to where you started four weeks ago. What's the point of okay, it? Okay, what was the interest rate change over the same month period? No. I don't are, the, are keeping the price the same for the consumer? Well, I, I think the point is that Tesla adjusts prices to match the demand that they're seeing on the ground. And they're tra and you know, other car companies they they're constantly changing prices, but they do it in a in a way that's not transparent because they're doing it through dealer incentives that are not obvious to the public. Tesla does it on a website where you can see the price change in a minute, where the car companies are doing, you know various kinds of incentives to the dealers to get the dealers to move cars and they're loading up dealer lot they're letting dealers are accumulating vehicles on lots and to some extent they handle the excess production by filling dealer lots with cars tesla's made a decision and this this is an interesting question should tesla say you know what instead of selling cars at a discount we're going to accumulate cars on lots and we'll we'll uh, sell them later when the prices go back up that's an no, interesting that's question no, that's terrible. In fact, I've often wondered, uh, you know, is, is this, I mean, this is just what happens in the auto industry. It's just that there's this obfuscation between legacy auto and the dealer network and, and even China auto and their dealer network of they just, they're, they're, you know, they're swapping prices and spiffs and back and forth. We don't see it where as Tesla is, you know, puts their prices on the website and, you know, you see everything. So the other thing is Tesla, <clears throat> If they're running 15 DOI uh, and, and, and half of that is in transit, that's insane. That, that's like insane levels of, of short. Basically, I, I don't even know how 
um, I don't even know how they maintain, you know, their product in stock for people to go sell a buy a car. I, I know a lot of people make that decision, you know, in a five to seven day window of like they want it, they want a car, they want to go buy one, they want to go find it, they don't want to place an order and wait six months for it. So I just think there's a very big difference in our in our thinking and kind of like how we're programmed with dealing with prices. I think Tesla's also changed how they're doing this. They were probably a lot more stable a few years ago. And the reason they were is we were in a zero interest rate environment and, you know, and inflation was under control. So, they, you know, if anything, they were raising prices, but not at these very small little levels. So this is definitely a bit, of, I would say, a bit of change in their behavior, but they're doing it in a construct of 15 DOI. If they let DOI go to 50, then you wouldn't be seeing as many price changes. Hey, just so people know, DOI is days of inventory. Yeah. I mean, that's a fact. If they let DO, DOI triple, you'd probably see a third or a half of the amount of price changes you see right now because they would just let it build up and let it flow. Uh, but they're, they're, they keep, they keep, they're keeping their inventory pretty tight. And that's really good from a cash perspective. That's really good from a COGS perspective because they're bringing material in and they're flushing it out quickly. Whereas you have, you have, uh, you know, legacy automakers. I mean, you've got, I mean, on the record, they have 120 to 150 days of inventory of their EVs. So then and now take their manufacturing times that are longer. Um, and you, you overlay those two things together that'll actually hurt them from a COGS perspective. I think that's why you saw GM COGS go in reverse uh, in the last quarter. Do consumer yeah. products companies like te like Apple track days of inventory? Is that something that's reported or people yes. can see? Yes. Uh, I don't know if it's reported ex externally, but uh, they absolutely track it like you would not believe. So, you know, you, we all know now, that, right? We all know that Tesla does dynamic pricing. In fact, he's already said that they're doing it on a daily basis. Um, and then we learned from uh, Nicholas Colas, who's an automotive ex industry expert. He said that people, when they buy cars, they make it, they make that decision, and they buy it within seven days after make that decision. So, you know, this idea that oh, they're jerking around the consumer. J consumers thought it was this price. They're waiting for that price. At the end of the day, you know, whether or not you think it's right or wrong, but it, it's really good for the company if they do dynamic pricing daily, and they're able to get to this point where they're able to control their cars production in hitting the demand and adjusting the price to get the cars moving um i think we just need to understand that and just move on from that but you know this is something that seems to be a sticking point for so many people you know why let me ask a question this ain't, this ain't, a, this ain't a, it's not a potato chip company okay and if every quarter you put on this promotion where you cut a thousand dollars off and you do it you know in the middle month of the quarter and if you do this every quarter after a while the consumer is just going to wait for the deal in order to buy. And then you're just accelerating volume from, you know, one part of the quarter to another. That's the worry I have. That this is not, you know, it's not a normal consumer goods company where you can promote it during, you know, the, the, the fourth through the eighth week. And that because people do learn to wait for a deal in that type of situation. I just but, don't but like Gary, that they, behavior. They, they, I hear you. They did, but they did the reverse. They, they put the, the, the deal on in the middle of the quarter. They said they're going to raise it for the third month of the quarter. So to me, they're, I, I, I agree with you. In the past, they've been conditioning consumers to wait for the third quarter, and that's really bad for them from a COGS perspective. So um, I agree with you. I, I, mean, I was gonna ask a hypothetical question, which actually may happen this year. What if gross margins go you know, to 18% this quarter, go to 19 to 20% in the next quarter? Are we gonna, do they now gain that credibility and we're not talking about this as much? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That, that would be true. Yes. That would be true. Stock price would go up and they would gain credibility. Absolutely, yeah, Jeff. The average all love would be it. over 20 by the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's totally doable, to be honest with you. It's just it's gonna take discipline and they're gonna have to have another killer year on on, on COGS, but I think it's it's doable. They gotta grow volumes and then they've gotta they've gotta hit their uh, their event driven plans. That's what <clears throat> they talked about. They talked about the packaging. Re the 22% reduction in logistics costs, they talked about, Drew talked about in Lars, those are event-driven items. They're not dependent on commodity flows. They're dependent on Tesla taking a specific action to delete a part, to reduce a process, to reduce something at a supplier, 
Um, and, and those event driven at things are what people, this is what companies do. They will do this in perpetuity, by the way, they will, as long as they're doing over a million units a year on model Y, they're going to have a cogs reduction program on model Y. So there's, there's the commodity driven reductions. There's the gigafactory reductions where they're going to be efficiency based, and then they're going to be event driven based. And then there's the su design and supply based reductions. What'll be event driven and all those will continue now they will vary in magnitude but and by the way I, to tesla's defense this is a very difficult thing to um to forecast but their their event driven list they i guarantee you they've got a list by quarter for what they're doing for the products for this year so they have a plan it's just you know how confident they are um <clears throat> in executing that plan do you, do you mind if I just uh, get yeah, Jeff? I think you you crush that, and and I think the people I think we'll start to see them. I think especially as Berlin takes over more deliveries in the European region, and they use rail, and I think we'll start to see some of these things come to fruition. But just for like contextualizing what people have been talking about the last thirty minutes, while kind of just listening, right? Volkswagen left China. GM is down almost two million units per year from China. These numbers don't necessarily show up in their annual reports because they're done via joint ventures versus the headline numbers of the solely owned uh, parent company. So like GM put their unit sales on page 27 of the last earnings deck, right? They're a car company. They just sell cars. That's all they got. They literally put the data for unit sales on page 27. So like there's not like the cars are getting sold, but they're just going down at such a rate that they're using financial maneuvering to make their earnings look better. If new cars are being bought in China, which we know they are, and if you look at the Tesla data, January from Shanghai looks like it's over a million a year from, from a production perspective, right? And the sales are actually pretty strong consistently in China. So, you know, I think the 2 million is a very low number. I've been at 225 since the middle of last year. I think there's upside and downside both ways, but I'm, I think 225 is a very conservative number. Um, but I think like, I think right now, and you talk about Elon's behavior and how everyone talks about everything on the calls, right? 2016 through 2022, there was a lot of things to, to walk investors through. Production plant being built, ramp up productions, new models, Right. I don't want to say we're at a mature, steady state, but as far as product pipeline and new factories, like most of the news is out. It's purely just execution. The only thing management really can comment on is guidance towards either the ramp of these facilities and when new market, new products can come to market. And then really, there's only like one or two that we really are focused on. Everything else is just kind of getting the flywheel spinning um, on what we currently have. Personally, I'm also seeing from the fleet replacement, I've, I've mentioned this before, the Uber, Lyft, rideshare, taxi kind of cohort, that demand is inelastic. And the replacement vehicles that come up, you're seeing a much larger spike where it was ICE to hybrid. The conversion of hybrid to pure EV in this segment alone is completely underestimated for the demand structure. Everyone's thinking about, you know, retail and the macro. I agree with Warren and some other people. The macro is shit. The data is terrible. Hard to link with it through the roof. Car financing rates are, are a lot higher because the recovery rate and also residual values are crashing. And you can see this in used dealer prices everywhere. But like the auto market is in shambles from a financial perspective, both in unit sales and financing. I think Tesla is in the most healthy position of any auto company, if you want to view it as just an auto company, relative to that type of business. But I, I think we have to look at with the conflicts that are going on, Middle East and and, and mid, uh, Central Europe, like oil prices are going to remain choppy. And I think the EV adoption rate at the fleet level is going to be accelerated and is more than enough to carry through the conversion rate of EV adoption that people are not talking about because other EVs from the legacy companies are just not selling. But I think we're seeing pure, a lot of demand for Rivian. I think we see a lot of demand for, for Tesla. And I think BYD and Geely and some of the other regions where there's strong production and, and trust from the consumer, we're seeing that adoption rate and conversion. And I think the American market and media takes it all for granted because the, the historical American companies are failing. So I think, I think there's a lot of conjecture regarding demand, but it, it, it's really not looking at the whole picture correctly. Okay. Eric, do you want to join? Yeah. 
Eric, are you there? Okay, we'll do uh, Victor, go ahead. Well, 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 before, sorry, while we're waiting for, I just want to point out, I, I had mentioned car dealership guy earlier. I just, in the, the purple button in the bottom right, I just put two of his recent posts about the reduction in availability of car financing and 50% of middle, middle Americans put off buying a car in 2023 because of financing issues. So there's, 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 there's a real issue here. Go ahead, Victor. Okay. We'll have um, Yoda. I don't, I don't see a Victor. Oh, there okay. he is. I Yoda? think he just got up. Yeah. I don't know, there, none of these people are able to speak for some reason. Yoda, are you there? Yeah, uh, yeah. I just, uh, Tesla doesn't use all the tools at their disposal. You know, I calculated if they allow, uh, if they give a yearly supercharging, right? I mean, that will cost about a thousand bucks. And uh, you know, instead of cutting thousand dollar in the price, if they provide that, I think it will be have more impact on the de demand. Maybe do it two two years, free charging or three years. Uh, that like thousand dollar increment, it has much bigger impact. Yeah, I, I hear that. Um, Jeff, I, I want to ask you a question because I think you know I've heard you know we 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 we, we always at and I know you you know this stuff pretty cold. So we hear about the interest rates, right? And macro, and I get it. It's harder to sell cars when you're financing it and you have higher interest rates. I get that. But what is the total um, vehicles sold around? I don't know if you, you probably know more, you know, America, North America. Is it is it growing? Can, can you give us some some type of percentages and then the EV growth? So so what I'm trying to get at, is it surprising even in this macro compared to other uh, autos that Tesla can't move more units? Or would you expect that this is where it would kind of land in, in this kind of uh, macro economic environment? Well, you, well I mean, you, 20, I just, 22 to... You keep saying they can't move... No, I, that was just for Jeff. I would just like, I'd just like you to hear you, Jeff. I'm not putting you on the spot or anything. Uh, yeah, 22 to 23 in the U.S. SAR grew 13 14%. Um, that's, you know, retails and they, and they filled that in. They actually, I think they mostly hit that the projection from last year. So from 2023 to 2024 is for total units in the U S I'm only speaking U S right now to grow one to 2%. So that's ice hybrid and EV, <clears throat> but the projections on EV are somewhere on the order. Some people are as low as 20% growth. Some are as high as 40% growth. So even if you take the 20% growth in EV uh, for in the U.S. for this year, that means ICE plus hybrid is negative growth year on year. So 1% to 2% growth in total in the U.S., but it looks like ICE plus hybrid is, is actually um, negative. For that color. And just one quick follow-up. They keep talking about how hybrids is catching fire, the EV narrative, people don't want EVs, and the hybrid narrative, this is a great transition. Is any of that making sense? Are hybrids really starting to grow, and they are they outpacing EVs this year or next year? Any comments on that? The growth level may be, may be outpacing, well, we don't know. I mean, this is just projections. But I think, I think hybrid was only around a couple hundred thousand units in, in North America last year. I have to go look it up, but I think when I looked at it before, it was a couple hundred thousand and, and then just coming on strong versus about 1.2 million. Yeah, the, actually, those are the numbers. Last year in, in the U.S., 1.4 million battery electric vehicles and hybrids shipped, and 1.2 of the 1.4 were pure battery electric EVs. Those are the numbers, I believe. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, but if they build more hybrid and they build less EVs, they're going to sell more and they push and they do incentives on hybrids. Yeah, they can they can double that number probably. Uh, but the point is, is EVs are going to are, are going to continue to grow. So, um, so yeah. Well, 
the prices are pretty similar. So you kind of lose out in the total cost of ownership. So I don't know if consumers are going to be that, like, I don't think consumers are that dumb. <laughs> I, I just don't see it that way. Yeah. Just to be clear, Global Star peaked in 2018. Like you look at 2019, it was really 2018. All of the legacy were down. Some of it was due to, they had, peak, they had great years in 2019, the first part of COVID. Production issues caused it. 2023 was their first year that they didn't have production issues. None of them rebounded above their peak performance years. VW, GM, et cetera, are all down significantly relative to their peak. And if you look at the, the trend line adjusted, right, there's a Tesla, the only one doing over a million units that actually grew consistently over the same three-year window is Tesla. And so like it, they're outperforming the trend line of actual sales relative to total global units. The expectation is potentially by 2030, we're going to be looking at somewhere between 100 and 110 million in global star and sales. But like that's kind of ambitious, I think. But, you know, I think somewhere between 85 to, to 90 is sort of where we're going to be. And if, you know, Tesla is somewhere between 7 and 10 million units a year, by 2030, I think they're going to be wildly successful relative to the market. So this question of, is there a demand problem for Tesla? I mean, I, obviously there's a, there's all these different ways to explain that or express it, right? So is there a slowdown in electric vehicles how about put it this way? Is there a growth in electric vehicle sales? Yes, we all agree. Is there a slowdown in electric vehicle sales? Well, if you look at, as we all know, the legacy EV sales, they're falling. But does that mean that Tesla's EV sales are falling? But then you guys are saying, well, if, if if the growth in Tesla's EV sales is growing, they've already said it's going to be lower than it was last year. So that's a fact. But is it low, so low that they have to cut prices and slash and burn the prices to even move metal out of the, the, the factories is what um, some of you have been saying. Is that what you guys are really thinking is happening? So even if the legacy auto is not able to produce EVs in the next couple of years and the EV demand is still growing compared to ICE, who's going to fill that? And yet you guys still think that Tesla will need to cut prices because the demand for Teslas are growing up. Can, can somebody walk me through what you're thinking is? Okay, but it's it's basically relative to expectations. So if before people thought EVs, let's not talk Tesla, EVs were going to grow at 30 to 35 percent a year. Now people are thinking it's going to grow at 15 to 20 percent per year. Okay, and that's what people are imputing for Tesla volume growth for 2024. That's, I think, what people are saying, that the EV growth is decelerating, but it's not falling, right? And so the question is, what happens to stock price? What happens to earnings estimates if that happens? Right now, the earnings estimates reflect 15 to 20 percent growth. If I look at consensus estimates for 2024, it's 2.1. That's 17 percent growth. So that's what's in Tesla's stock price today. And so I think if they can beat 15 to 20 percent growth, Tesla will be fine because that's the new expectation for Tesla's volume growth, which is about probably what the EV volume growth is globally. If I can just you know, chip in here that there are people who are looking at, well, what will Tesla do this year? And they're letting that decide what the stock price should be. And there are people, Gary keeps referring to investors. So there's different types of investors, I guess I would say. And I, my personal opinion is if you're not a long-term investor, you're not really an investor. What Tesla sells this year says almost nothing about what Tesla will be doing in 2030 or 2032 or 2029 or whatever year you're looking at as your long-term target. And I, think 2030 at this point is not even a long-term target anymore. So, you know, what What some of us are looking at is how are they doing on the technology? Are they making progress on FSD? Are they growing Dojo? What's happening with Optimus? And I don't expect that we're going to get a lot of information on these things unless FSD turns a corner. You know, version 12 may be the holy grail. We can't know that yet. If FSD version 12 starts showing major improvements, that's a hint about the future. If we start seeing something with Optimus by the end of this year, which I think is over optimistic, but it could happen. Those are things. The long term future value of Tesla is embodied in FSD and Optimus. And then you have the next generation vehicle, which they basically told us 
you're not going to learn much about the next generation vehicle until 2025. Um, you know, I was really excited about them describing the manufacturing what they're doing for manufacturing the next generation vehicle that they're re you know most car companies are building cars with robots that exist you know, off the, effectively off the shelf robots may be somewhat modified they basically told us they're re-engineering the robots that build cars they're i, I think they said they're re-engineering the machines that build the robots that build the cars but maybe i misunderstood that um so i think I'm looking for a company that's trying to change the game, not for a company that's trying to manage this year's, you know, numbers and and satisfy Wall Street analysts. When you look at what they talked about in the earnings yeah. call, you see in 4680, and they mentioned future vehicle programs. What was that? There's all kinds of things that are coming that is hard for us to see, and we might not see them in 2024. And to some extent, this is a game of faith. Are we seeing things that support our faith? Like I'm, I'm not backing away from it. I'm a cultist, right? People call me a cultist. Fine, I'm a cultist. I see evidence to support my faith. And if you don't see the evidence to support the faith, then, you know, buy, buy a company that has, you know, normal earnings calls and CEOs who don't talk on X. Appreciate you, Warren. You just said I, everything I was say, I said earlier. Yeah. Real get, quick, Herb, go, real quick, Herbert, I just want to kind of play back and forth. So Warren, I agree with exactly what you said, but, you know, the stock trade, you know, to get to 2030, we got to get through 24, 25, 26. And, and, you know, the reason why we talk about it is because, from day to day, that, that that's what we enjoy. We enjoy markets, and but but to your point, so we've had comments from Elon. Now, these are just facts. This is not me playing. Yes, I love it. I I don't love it. Love it. He said on one conference call, Dojo could be a zero. He said on the last conference call, Dojo's a long shot. So yes, you have to have faith because I think you've called Dojo possibly to be as big as Nvidia, which it may happen, but that 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 would be amazing but we have elon on record on two separate occasions saying it could be a zero we have v12 and i know omar's here and maybe it's great and and he uses it every day but you know we've had a little bit of a lull in that and and updates are coming a little slower and things of that nature so the market sees that so so that gets priced in a little bit okay maybe it'll happen maybe it won't maybe it'll take a lot longer so i'm just giving you some you know uh, understanding of what other people and investors yes they are investors what they're thinking about wait let's, let me finish a couple more points that's two of the points the third point is we've had a company that was growing and i understand macro that was growing units 80 percent one year 50 percent for now now units are going at 15 percent with their prices so i'm not saying it's tesla's fault i'm just saying it's a fact we talk about Dojo. we had a growth company that was growing really fast and it's growing slower can we, can we talk about so Dojo? when you take all these and then we have a bot program that still has many years to get to to any type of scale so when you t take all that into consideration i don't think you could say to investors you don't know anything you guys are stupid just trust me bro and everything will can be we all talk right about dojo you brought up Dojo. Can we talk about sure. Dojo? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I'm just I just quoted what Elon said. You, I didn't say you, anything you, about. It. I just said what Elon you, said. You, you this is your your cherry picking. First of all, Elon said that SpaceX had a 10% chance of succeeding, and Tesla had less than a 10% chance of succeeding. What did he say? What else did he say about Dojo? What did he say about Dojo's future? Did you catch that part about version 1.5, version two, and version three? If he thinks Dojo is going to fail, why are they working on a version three when they're only on version one? Right. They're, they're, you know, this this is the point about the, the whether you have faith or not. Right. If you are a short term investor, if you don't see the few, if you're if you're not trying to see the long term future that Tesla is going for, you say, well, why would they be working on a dojo version three if they thought this thing wasn't going to fly? Right. They're working on a dojo version one point five, a version two and a version three, because they think there's something really important going on there. Right. And and or maybe they're broke. They're working on a three, one point five and two don't work. Well, okay. So, so, well, one point five I don't think is out yet. Um, they're working. They're currently using version one. They're working on a one point five, two, and three. So, my point is that you heard, oh, Dojo might be a flop. Well, that's true of any startup business, right? Any startup he business. He said that about Cybertruck. Sorry. He said that about Cybertruck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, like, and and no people are still saying it about Cybertruck. Some people still think Cybertruck's a flop. I don't know. I mean, I keep hearing great things. Nobody believes Cybertruck would be a flop. You can look at the earnings forecast. They all but Elon said it could be. Cybertruck. But nobody cares what Elon says. I mean, you guys might care, but the, the, the investment community that sets the price comes up with their own numbers. So the street right now for 2030 is at 5.4 million units. That's only 17% growth. That's where the street is. 
right? I'm at about 10 million for 2030. I know Elon's talked about 20 million, but nobody's listening to Elon when he says 20 million units by 2030. The street's coming up with their own numbers. And then those become the, the, the benchmarks that they have to beat. So right now, back to your point, Warren, yeah, people are looking short term at 1.8. And I, what I as an analyst do, if I see 17, I'm sorry, at, at, uh, at 2.1, which is 17% growth, let's suppose they do 17% growth. I as an analyst will put in 17% growth as a starting point, And that's how I as an analyst am getting to 5.4 million years by 2030. If you think it's really going to be more like 30% growth, then you buy the hell out of the stock because the street's going to be wrong. I don't value Tesla based on the volume of vehicles they sell in 2030. And if, if you're looking at Tesla, you know, what does Elon say? We're an AI and robotics company. And, and you know, Christian just said, Elon said this about Dojo, right? So some, some investors are listening to what he says and they're interpreting what they want. Um, Tesla, I, I question myself whether they're going to get to 20 million vehicles. I think I've, I've posted a video about it. I've talked about it. I think there's a question, you know, given that the next gen vehicle isn't, going into production until the second half of 2025, I'm trying to figure out how you scale to 20 million vehicles in that short of a time, especially with the his comments about first we'll do it in Texas, and then after Texas is in production, then we're going to do Giga Mexico, and after Giga Mexico is in production, then we're going to do another country. That sounds like they're not producing at large scale until 2027. Um, you know, that's, that's a, that's, so I'm concerned about that long term. But then there's the question, well, let's say, let's suppose they actually crack a nut. And it's not a $25,000 vehicle, it's a $20,000 vehicle, right? I mean, which is, you know, Drew Baglino said, I don't know how many earnings calls ago, or maybe it was investor day, half the footprint, half the cost, twice the volume, right? So half the cost would mean it would be half the cost of a Model 3. Model 3 sells for, I think, under $40,000, or the previous generation Model 3 before the upgrade sold for under $40,000, and certainly selling for under $40,000 in other parts of the world, in China. So, you know, if the next generation vehicle ends up having a price point under $20,000, then maybe they just, once they get ramped, they make a lot of factories and they sell a lot of those cars. I, I don't have a grip on that. But the value in Tesla is, do they deliver on RoboTaxi? Do they deliver on Optimus? That's where the real long-term value is in the company, more so than selling a number, a number of cars. And that's correct. And all I'm saying is the street right now is thinking, 5.4 million cars in 2030. So if you believe that they can do 10 million, let's say you don't believe 20 million, because I believe 10 million, that's the number I've, I come up with $290 of valuation without putting any value on RoboTaxi, meaning SAS, S-A-S. So I, I put no value on Optimus, and I'm still coming up with $290 of value, and it stocks at 184. So I buy it even without any putting any value on robots. And that's that's all. That's the only point I'm making. That it's still very, very cheap as a stock, even if you don't put any value for this other stuff. Can I add one thing to that that no one's talked about? So Blackstone spent twenty-five billion dollars on an AI data center investment. The they bought a QTS company. It requires six gigawatts of energy to run the data center. They don't have the current power for the data center. They need to increase the power supply for their data center network in order to achieve their AI desired yeah. outcome from a compute power perspective. JP, JP, we can't. I can't hear you. You're 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 just very very light uh, slight. Can we can we um, and until you fix it? Can you come back, Scott? Hey guys, great show. This is uh, one of the best I've heard, and uh, it's great to see Warren and Gary on the speaker panel together, no blood. This is fantastic. Um, just, uh, you're talking about strengths and weaknesses and, and just avoiding the stock completely. One of the main things that I noticed out of the earnings call this year that I, I, I can't see that you guys have touched on yet today, and, and Warren kind of brought up the cultism, um, I was very impressed by the conversion rate. 90% um, of their cars sold last year were for customers that have never purchased a Tesla before. That's a that's outstanding, and I think that uh, when you when you look at all the people that were buying at really high prices and they're you know a year or two of depreciation um, underwater right now, uh, I think that those those people are going to come back around for Teslas in the next couple of years. If the conversion rate stays how it is, I think we're at a low. So I'm not really worried about as far as vehicles go. 
Um, I think that that uh, energy, if it keeps going at 100% growth rate like it is right now, I know Canada has a lot of back order for for uh, battery packs up here, and Shanghai coming online with that. I think th I think the future is pretty bright just with the vehicle growth and just with uh, energy growth, and that's just not even thinking about the software and robotics side of it. Um, but definitely, I'm a long term investor. I've sold none of my shares in the last few weeks, and I'm not worried. No, I love that. And that goes kind of goes to the point. Um, you know, I understand where Warren's coming from. And, and I've talked about too, bot, like some of that, you have to like think about that stuff. But on a day to day basis, so like when, if we talk about that for Tesla, we could say that for a lot of companies. We, we could say, you know, Apple's Vision Pro, they're going to do, you know, 8 million units and they're going to like, we, we can extrapolate on, on a lot of companies what they might do. But you have to value a business on what you can kind of see. You can't just say, I know they're going to be doing, you know, 50 million bots and they're going to make X amount of money and that should be priced in the stock today. That's not how it works. Google could come out with some fantastic thing and they're on every place in the world. And if they're AI on the phones, on the Android, if they're able to hit something, you know, multiply whatever they could charge because it's such a great product multiplied by how many people have Android phones and you got a lot of money. But you can't just do that right now on Google stock because we don't know if they got it or not. And so I, I just I just like to kind of think about it like that. Like when you're valuing a business, you have to think about kind of what's in your, you know, sphere. You could actually see and extrapolate out maybe six months, a year, two years. You, you can't go out to 2030, 2035, and I know this is going to happen. I guess you can for faith. But you can't expect that to be in a stock price. I, I, you know, it's I know, just obvious. But I, mean, but I mean, Microsoft historically traded at 22 times, and now they're trading at, I think, 32 or 34. So they've had a 50% growth in their PE. Their prior year's growth has been single digits. I think last year they cracked double digits, and all they've done is do demos on this co-pilot that works half the time. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's questionable. I agree, with you. I agree with you, Jeff. There is a hype in Microsoft, but I could say the same thing about Tesla trading at 60 times forward. Basically, 90% of their revenues, 85% of the revenues is a car company, and they're trading at 60 times. So even though nobody believes any AI is in the price, I do. I believe there is a little bit of premium uh, of, of FSD or RoboTaxi. There is a little bit of premium of a possible, you know, Optimus bot, you know, four or five, six years out. You know, otherwise it wouldn't be getting a premium 60 forward on, on negative year over year earnings. I might be wrong. Yeah, and this is the difference between somebody who's looking for a 2x or 3x or 30% growth versus somebody who's looking for investing of a 10x or you know 20x growth. This is what I was talking about at the beginning, right? Tesla is a disruptive technology. So if you are trying to wait until you have a, a product out and then you're gonna go and use spreadsheets to figure out exactly what the growth is, then that's what then you wait for that, right? That's fine. But others are investing because they know that this company is going to innovate and there's going to be something new that is disruptive, which means an entire industry is just going to go away and Tesla will be taking the bulk of that market share and they're going to completely change the game. And you, they're like, like uh, Warren was saying earlier, you have to have faith and that faith is built on you know, the company and what they've proven in the past. And then you look at the, 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 the business model that they're creating and you can see, based on that business model, what's going to happen to the industry. You could have seen it when Netflix came out and Blockbuster. You could have seen it when Apple came out with the smartphones. But many, many people said there's no way that's going to happen. This is the price. You know, you know, you know. Famously, Balmer said the price is is, is dead in the water, three thousand dollars per. They couldn't think further ahead, or they refused to think ahead. So, I mean, that's the difference, right? That's the the big difference between the people looking for a 10x and a 20x versus those who are just, hey, I only put my money, and if I know for sure, I'm going to get a 30 percent gain next year. Yeah, so that's the other part of why I focus on the rate of innovation that Elon has mentioned, because Tesla Energy was negative 500 million in 2019, and, and they're plus 500 million in 2023, right? So you see that business growing, it's, it's becoming material, but it's not that material comparatively to the billions of cash uh, flow that's coming in from the vehicle side. So it gets dwarfed and doesn't see it. So when, when I first invested in 2012, 
I, the reason why I was in 2012 and not in 2010, even though I've been following Tesla since 2006, is because they were the first uh, EV startup to actually buy a factory and put real machines in the factory. So I know they were serious because all the rest of them were just prototypes. So and they, they already had a couple thousand roasters. So they're actually producing it even though they didn't own the factory. Now they own the factory. They're, they had the prototype and beta and they had the factory being filled with with uh, the machinery. So that's where I can see, hey, it's, they're going to actually produce it. I have more faith in the, their, their feasibility of it versus the other ones just creating prototypes. And that's why I see the same trajectory even with the Model 3 production hell came. He said production hell, the stock got hammered for a couple of years, like nobody liked that, but it was true, it's production hell. And after that volume production, and we have the 10X in the, in the 2020 year. So I see that with the Tesla energy side, it's growing rapidly, very fast. And there's other stuff that's gonna come out that's probably not gonna be in the equation yet. I think the app store eventually is gonna make money and software doesn't cost a lot of CapEx. So there's certain side businesses because Apple went uh, started didn't give a guidance when their iPhone became saturated. Everyone didn't like it. Um, and they're at 1 trillion. Everyone said, there's no company that's ever made 1 trillion. They're not gonna grow anymore. They made a huge business with their accessories, their headphones. Now, possibly a division, and they've reached close to three trillion. So, I, I think there's a lot of uh, focus that needs to be done on the rate of innovation, and Tesla Energy is definitely growing really rapidly. It's that, uh, yeah. What you're talking about is like Apple built a moat, and you know, Christian, you said hype in Microsoft. There, there's not hype. It's there's a moat. They've they've developed a platform, they've bought platforms, and they've integrated them to scale what they do. I think Tesla's built as much as they can. And this was kind of say before, whether it's AI or the cars or the robots, whatever in the future, right? Energy is the number one dependency for the company. So Blackstone, giant private equity firm, people don't know who it is. They just put a $25 billion investment into QTS, which is a data center. Um, and it we're, like what they're trying to do, it, it's essentially data centers focused on AI development. The grid actually can't support the compute power of the data centers that they need. It's the, their data center footprint requires six gigawatt hours, uh, or six gigawatts in order for it to run, which is approximately equivalent to like some 5,000 homes in the surrounding areas around it. They need to increase the grid supply in order for their AI play to work, right? They're not going to be alone. If AI is going to be prevalent and data is going to go up and data center user utilization is going to go up, the demand for energy is the first principle problem to stop. Therefore, Tesla's energy, whether it's for peaker plants or private companies like this scenario, they're the biggest at scale essentially provider right now. And if, I don't know if anyone else saw, the Department of Defense, the, the military base in North Carolina was running on CAT-L uh, uh, batteries. The Department of Defense said you got to take out a Chinese software supplier and replace it with an American one. Um, it's it's too much of a risk. The, the software part of it, and the, again, this feeds into supercharging. No one really talks about the moat at which the energy part of the business is going to create. I had about $10 billion in revenue this year for, for supercharging. Um, that's just out of Tesla cars. As more OEMs come onto the network, uh, I actually can't really forecast because there might be a variable rate for Tesla versus non-Tesla. But like, this is not really how people are thinking about it, but as far as like what the moat and the free cash flow that's generated from these two businesses, both from a hardware perspective and then from a reoccurring free cash flow, like it's just not in anyone's models at the scale at the rate at which EVs will be. It's just it's just the rate at which they get there, but nobody's putting in st charging stations or energy storage solutions at the same clip that Tesla is right now. Yeah, a hundred percent. And just to be clear, when I say AI, AI, AI hype, I don't mean it's hype. I believe in AI. I believe this is coming. This is going to change the world. And these companies, biggest companies in the world, are the real deal. I was just addressing the valuation expansion. So, but I agree with you. Uh... Can I ask Omar something? Omar, are you on? Yeah, he's on. He's raising his hand. <laughs> so, FSD right now. It's got about a take rate from what I calculate about 12 and a half percent globally. And if one of the biggest drivers of the stock would be if that take rate as, as FSD gets better and better, if that take rate would go from 12 and a half to 30 or 40, so just put numbers on it at $199 a month, it's about 600 million in profits, gross profits. And um, 
that's you know auto gross profits are about 16 million 16 billion so it's very it's like four percent but if you could get that take rate up to 40 or 50 percent it's a huge increase in tesla earnings like you know 40 50 cents a share so what are your thoughts omar on how you get that take rate up from 10 or 12 percent today to 40 or 50 percent yeah, I think that the way I sort of look at it is I look at the number of Teslas that have access to FST beta and the number that are actually running it. So based on the NHTSA recall notices, we know there's around 2 million Teslas in North America and there's around 400 to 500,000 FST beta users. So around 20% of people who have access to it have bought or subscribed to it. So if we could get that up to, you know, 50 or more, that would obviously be huge. And with FSD 12, I think they've hit a lot of the pain points that cause people to cancel their subscriptions. The robotic driving feel, the harshness, um, the comfort is much improved. So I think this and the 12.2, they're supposed to be starting to roll it out to more people, early access testers, hopefully, you know, as soon as this weekend. Um, we saw it start rolling out on Tesla Scope last weekend to some of the employees. I think that could really be the key to getting us above 50%. They really haven't scratched the surface in terms of what they can do. If they offer some free trials, maybe play with pricing a little bit, I think that it's a product that's sort of inherently addictive, especially as it gets comfortable. People will buy it and stay subscribed to it. And if you can get the take rate or sort of the penetration above 50%, you can easily double the profit of the automotive business. And Wall Street doesn't really care about pricing at the end of the day, they care about earnings. So if pricing goes down, but you see earnings growth, I think they'll be happy with that. So I'm hoping that we see pricing stabilize this year. I think they're getting closer to COGS. I don't think we're going to see another, you know, 20% price cut or anything like that. I think uh, COGS are starting to come down a little bit too. Things are stabilizing. So hopefully if we can see some stabilization in the vehicle business through the year in terms of ASPs, along with a higher FSD subscription or purchase rate, you could see earnings growth return to the business and um, potentially beat expectations if that version 12 really is something that works really well across the country and can get, you know, a majority of Tesla customers to buy or subscribe. Can I ask you something? So if I look at the Tesla website, I had somebody do this for me and look at model Y with FSD, the used, the inventory, the used um, pricing. If I look at model Y long range with uh, FSD versus without the difference is only about four grand, which means the market is saying I'm only going to pay four grand for FSD. How do you think about that versus that they're charging 12 grand or do you care? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, I think you, when you think about your used car buyer, your used car buyer is not really the kind of person who's looking to spend $12,000 on a software option. They're the kind of person who's looking for a deal. They don't want the extra depreciation on their car. They're not necessarily going to pay $12,000. Maybe the $200 a month subscription or something like that could be for them. But ultimately, every Tesla is sort of in play here. I think if I had to kind of summarize Tesla strategy, what they're doing here, we just need to get as many heads into the Tesla camp as possible. And if we can do that, they use supercharging, they use insurance, they use FSD, and they could play with the pricing. They could say, okay, $99 a month. And you have potentially all those people, whether they bought this as a used car for, let's say, $28,000, or they bought a new Model Y for 50 k all of them have the chance to subscribe. So, I mean, it's sort of an interesting issue, and you would think that the residual value might actually track the value to some extent. You might see it go up as it becomes more material to more people. I also think people just don't understand it. So they just totally have no clue. And cars are often transacted without really understanding the option at all. Discounts but, aside, but presumably I believe we need started, education and we really need advertising for... <laughs> hey. 
I just muted his mic. But yeah, presumably, <laughs> if, bring up Herbert. If, if people on. started valuing the option more, you should see it start to be reflected in the residual values, I think. But that hasn't really happened yet. So if you if you had like a trial at ninety nine bucks a month, what do you think the you know the the the, the, the let's say the take rate? But what do you think the percentage would be that people would continue to pay? say one ninety nine a month because as you say they get addicted to it if they start at ninety nine dollars because that would be an interesting strategy to try like first six months at ninety nine dollars a month and then it goes to the normal price. What do you think that the continuation rate would be? You think it's like fifty percent, seventy percent? Yeah, I think that um at ninety nine dollars a month, I think you could get the majority of US customers to sign up, especially with V twelve. Once people try, you know, say give everyone a free trial and then it continues at 99 a month after that, you can do it. Why not? And the thing that I love about the subscription pricing is you're never guaranteeing them what that price is long term. So you can change or lower it any month, right? You can like Netflix. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you can sort of give them a lower price and get them hooked and then raise it slowly over time and just see growth that way. But the important thing is just to get them interested. And I think the issue has really been just that the software hasn't been quite there yet. It's been good for early adopters, fun to look at. But in terms of actually having that comfort level, having that reliability level, version 12, I think, is going to be that moment where it actually makes sense to have a strategy that is geared around generating demand for FSD. Right now, they have not really scratched the surface of trying to generate demand for FSD, even though they could easily offer a free trial to everybody, just because I, I think of where the state of the software is. With version 12, that has changed completely. And I believe they can you know, pursue a strategy like this where they're trying to lower the price, maximize the number of users, and do it in a way where the, the users actually come away very impressed and want to keep the subscription. Thank you. Another thing they could do to, to drive demand on FSD is just, you know, get it out there globally, Europe, you know, China. I mean, for every Tesla and every FSD capable Tesla in the U.S., I think there's one and a half of them not in the U.S. So they can just get it qualified for use globally. That could probably be the, even a more near term and more assured, you know, jump in, in usage. I mean, it's a huge upside opportunity to 2024 estimates, to your point. If today, you know, people are using a 12% take rate, if you could suddenly, you know, jump it to 40% or 50%. And remember, when people define take rate, they take take rate as a, you know, in, in, in the a denominator, they take the current, like, 2.1 million. But to Jeff's point, you really got to be taking the whole, you know, the whole fleet. And so it could be a huge number if, if you know, even if they tried doing like ninety nine dollars a month for the first so, three months or six months. Yeah, Gary, in your yeah, especially, it's like you. Sorry, go ahead, Omar. Yeah, I think definitely you could see sort of the attach rates increase, and it's easy to sort of look at the earnings that come from after sales and subscriptions. But I think it also is going to just back up vehicle demand. You're probably going to see higher demand for new and used vehicles as awareness of this gets out and people see, especially what version 12 can do, it's gonna probably, I think, prop up the used values of Teslas, the values of new Teslas, because, you know, electric has become more and more common and it's a great thing, but it's less of a differentiator as it was, say, 10 years ago. Now, basically every brand has committed to going electric. And Tesla does it better than anybody else. They have a lot of experience. But this is a differentiator, especially when you think about like the Chinese market, the European market. This is a differentiator that Tesla is far above the capabilities of what anything else in the market is providing. So especially as we look in Europe and China. So China, we've seen some discussions. We've seen some filings from the government that have indicated they're working on an FSD beta China. In Europe, we know that some of the regulations around ADAS have made it a little bit difficult, but those are being revised now. If they can actually get this out there, we go from a situation where FSD beta is available from 33% of Tesla's customers to 
you know, potentially 70% or 100% of their customers, especially in markets like China, which are highly competitive, then just on an accounting basis, they have a sort of deferred revenue unlock. It would probably be small, smaller than it was in North America, but you'd have an unlock for China and for Europe, along with higher, you know, subscription sales or aftermarket purchases that have the potential to really provide that surprise and earnings that Wall Street isn't working into their models today. I want to add, uh, so, you know, Gary, you were, you were talking about FSD, right? That's going to be like $99 a month. Uh, we already have premium connectivity that gives $10 a month. What number per month would you like to see before you go, hey, this is a real, you know, additive to the margin and I don't necessarily have to, it, you know, worry. I don't have to worry so much about that on the car sales. Like uh, the reason I'm asking that is when when um, Sandy Monroe was asking David Lau, you know, the VP of Software Engineering, software vehicle software at Tesla, he asked them, you know, is there partnerships possibly? And he said, well, the software is tightly integrated with the hardware, but he said that we are. I don't know what exact words he said, but something like we have. Uh, we're working on APIs. And so that's kind of possibly leading towards an app store. And so that could possibly be additional monthly fees that they can charge to you know, users. And so what number per month would make you happy? Is it like 10 bucks a month? Not enough. Is it 100 bucks a month? Then that starts getting you excited. I don't know. I mean, it's probably about 10% of auto gross profits. So if auto gross profits are, let's call it you know, 20 billion, uh, they're not that high. They're about 16 billion. You know, if it gets up to be about a billion and a half dollars, I'll start modeling it in. But right now, I just put in a, you know, a take rate and then, you know, basically say that's going into my ASP. But if, you know, I would break it out as a separate line item and start actually trying to forecast it, it's probably more than 10 percent of, you know, let's say 16 billion. And so that's to me, that's kind of like a new way of thinking for me, because I've never really put that much in for FSD. But, you know, given what I'm seeing that people are getting more excited about FSD, you know, because of V12, and it just seems to get getting closer to like a level four type uh, technology, then, you know, you got to start thinking about it more to $199 a month in perpetuity. And what is that worth if you can get the take rate up, as Omar says, to 40 or 50%, it could be, it could be really huge. And it's not just on, you know, the exist, the, the, the current year sales of 2.1, it's on the whole fleet. And so the number becomes very big. And I know analysts are not modeling that. And look, I'm always about versus expectations and, you know, what's the earnings surprise going to be. If you could get the take rate up to 40 or 50 percent, then it's a huge potential earnings surprise. Yeah, I mean, the auto business is inherently cyclical. You're always going to have stronger periods of growth and weaker periods of growth. If you have a business where you have millions of users times thousands of dollars a year, in ARR, you can say, okay, this user is going to supercharge this much. They're going to uh, spend $2,400 a year on FSD. They're going to spend $120 a month on premium connectivity. They're going to spend this much on Tesla insurance. I can tell you what the average you know, value of the user of my fleet is, and it's this many thousands of dollars. People get into the Tesla ecosystem and they tend to be retained. It's one of the most loyal brands out there in automotive. People get in there and, you know, all the Tesla vehicles integrate together. Okay, I got this charger installed. Well, now I'm more likely to get another Tesla vehicle that works with this charger. Okay, now I'm going to, you know, be able to have cloud profiles between one vehicle and the other. I'm able to use FSD on both of them. It's this whole ecosystem, right? So you get people in, you get them subscribed. And the next time there's a period of weaker growth, maybe you can have this subscription revenue that continues growing. Because even if the economy is a little bit weaker, people are going to still continue needing insurance, FSD, premium connectivity, all of these things. And you can just show growth just by adding a few users, right? If the, if the revenue is guaranteed, you don't have to go make a car. It's just coming in automatically. And all you have to do to have growth is just subscribe a few more people. It's a lot easier than you know, the auto business, which is a lot of work, it's highly competitive. You have to really go out and earn that dollar of auto sales every year. Yeah, what what Martin should do, Martin Becker should do is break it out as a separate line item because then people will track it. Right now, it's it's buried underneath 
average ASP, average selling price. And, you know, it would be nice if just, as you just said, subscription revenues were a separate line and then we would all model it. And that would, that would be very interesting because I can take, I can tell you people don't do that today. They just kind of do what I'm doing is taking. I agree. Omar was making me bullish. No, you You're know, making me bullish Omar. I think, <laughs> you know, Gary, I think if it was good, they would share it. So it must be bad, right? You probably don't yeah. have that much of an uptake at the current prices where the current software is. Now, if they start yeah. to get creative and they've released V12, I think that could change a lot. But all they really have to do is tell that story to Wall Street. Because right now, what's the story? The story is just declining profitability, right? So if you tell a different story and you say, hey, look, here's a AI business that's growing. Let's, let me just give you some way to quantify that. A growth in subscriptions, you know, something where you can start to see that, then maybe the narrative starts to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, people look at an average selling price of 43.5. And if you're getting $199 a month times 12, that's 2.4. But it's only, to your point, 10% tax rate. That's, you know, it's a tiny number. Quick, quick question for you, Gary. I know when we've talked before, you always said you know, Tesla could be, you know, a great investment. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like a multi-trillion dollar investment just on the EV business alone. You know, the growth of the EVs, EV share, multiply it by this, we, 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 get a, we get a market cap. Has your, I see you talking more about, you know, possible, you know, FSD and you're looking on the software side more and you're just commenting more on that. Is your, is your thoughts changing on that? If, 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 Tesla's going to get that multi-trillion valuation. Do you think now it has to be something other than cars, where before you were mainly focused on cars? No, I just do it as a discipline. To me, if I'm going to own something like Tesla, I, I have to have a conservative view. So I'm always trying to keep it realistic. So as I said before, I'm using 10 million units for 2030 because I assume a 60% EV adoption rate and I assume a certain share about 20% of the EV. And I know people don't think like that, but that's how I model. And then I put an average selling price on it based on, you know, the mix of how many Model 3s, how many Model Ys, how many the $25,000 car. And I try to come up with a, you know, a profit number, put a multiple on it. And that's how I do it. And I come up with it. But, but for conservatism, I've never put in anything extra for, say, robo-taxi or, you know, to, to Warren's point, Optimus, I just say that's a free option. That's something that if I get it, great. But if I don't get it, I'm not I'm not counting on it because it's not real to me today. But FSD, because it keeps getting better and better, seems like I should do something more with it than just put an attach rate of, say, 10 or 12 percent. It feels like I should do something more. And I, 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 I really would like to talk to Martin about maybe breaking out subscription revenue if they really think it's going to become a bigger number. But, you know, Omar's probably right. It's probably not a big number yet. And that's why they don't break it out. So I don't include anything extra to your question. I just kind of do what I've always done, which is take, you know, SAR times EV adoption um, times Tesla's EV share based on a bottom up, you know, here's what Model 3, Model Y, $25,000 car is. And I put a, you know, revenue rate on each one of those. And that's why when they cut prices, by, you know, say a thousand or two, I have to feed it through my model in perpetuity, just the discipline I have. But I don't really put much in for FSD right now. I think to all of your points too, I think Tesla is going to have to tell that story around FSD performance, or, I mean, they just have the data and they, maybe they never tell this, the, the, the story and they just do it in terms of, you know, accidents per mile driven or something. But, but this March that we've been doing since V10, V11, V12, I mean, we have drives, like we have our own kind of qualitative views of like, I've driven all these versions and, you know, what feels better, what feels worse, but there's got to be some sort of like aggregate, like two or three metrics around disengagements, around um, uh, interventions, around you name it. I I'm sure they have the data, um, but if there's a story to tell there, you'd think that they would be positioning that as well to say, all right, you know, we've seen this uh, precipitous drop off and this, you know, now that we've stabilized 12, we've got onto this main line and we've been able to debug it for a month or two. Now, you know, you know, the second release on 12 versus the second release on 11, you know, we're seeing this type of stability and performance. And I think they're just, there's going to have to be a story either for themselves or, you know, and that will dictate what they do, I think, with pricing and with 
you know, going wide with it as well. I think that's one of the reasons too. I think they've applied for all these licenses, but I also think they want to they want to drive some level of stability and performance before they go too wide as well. Yeah, I would prefer if just, my, went, just my opinion. I would prefer if they went to a full subscription model on FSD and you know maybe built in premium connectivity and this way I would I would, and if they gave it out like if they gave a number I I and everybody else would model it and we to your point Omar you know even if EV growth is slowing you know we could always model out you know here's the fleet size here's the you know the adoption rate of FSD and you know premium connectivity and you'd model it out 23 to 30 2030 discount it back and we could attach it as a as a valuation driver, but nobody does that today. I guarantee it. I don't do it. I'm sure nobody else does it. Second price increase on the Model Three Long Range in the U.S. Kristen, is that today? Yes, yeah, so five hundred dollars. Um, That's a start. No, they they did it two a week or two ago. I mean, this is another one. Yeah, I just saw Sawyer. Was it enough five hundred bucks? What was the price increase? Yeah. Andre Karpathy has left open AI. Well, probably heading to XAI. All is breaking news. So He's coming back. back. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. He's only there like, what, six months? Interesting. Well, this was a... You know, guys, yeah. let me just say something. Yeah. Version 12 is not just hype. It actually is a significantly better approach you guys when you try it and it won't be that long they're working on rolling out 12.2 to a lot more people it really is a breakthrough and i think everyone will agree right away it hits a lot of the pain points that i think separate this from being you know a toy for early adopters to actually being something that ordinary consumers can't live without and here in San Francisco, we have the Waymo service from Google. It takes us around driverless, point to point, 24 7, anytime, perfectly. So I think it's really important for investors to internalize that this really is happening. There really is massive amounts of progress. It's easy to dismiss it and say, look, this is something that the industry has been working on for more than a decade. And, you know, maybe there's another decade to go. Who knows? But, there really is a lot of progress being made. And Goldman estimates that Tesla did one to three trillion uh, billion of FSD revenue last year. So that's a pretty material business already, even as an ADAS system. Uh, Omar, do you think that um, we're all gonna experience that, even me in Washington State or, or Jeff in Chicago? I do, yeah. I think everybody will be able to see the difference. Hey, Sawyer, were you here to report I've, any I've breaking had people news? around the country, people in Minnesota, Washington, all over the place DMing me, and they've reported some pretty good results. These are... I, I've, all, I've, always seen, I've always seen the relative improvement, by the way, even in, in Chicago. I don't, I've never, I never... The way that Tesla architected the system, I don't think it's area dependent. I mean, I, I honestly don't think that. Um, it is. <laughs> it is area dependent guaranteed it is that, that nobody can debate that is absolutely even elon said that it's overfit for california specifically because of the weather is what he actually said oh well that, yeah i'm just saying good weather to good weather I, I, don't, I don't know anyway not much of a debate yeah i wouldn't drive it on snow yet sorry are you here to break any breaking news <laughs> well i mean i think you guys broke it for me uh but yeah, no, the second Model 3 price increase in nine days. Uh, last one was 1000 bucks. This one's 500 so 1500 total. I, I think this is a combination of decent demand, uh, but also a lack of supply. We haven't seen a ton of new threes coming out of Fremont quite yet. But nonetheless, you know, the trend's good. Now that this price increase has happened, the, with including the federal tax credit, a Model Y long range now from Tesla's inventory is $10,000 less than a Model 3 long range, which is pretty wild. I don't know if you were here. The, yeah, the only thing first I'm half of this whole show was that there's a tremendous demand problem that Tesla had. People were hammering me. No. No, the only thing I'll say is you don't, you don't, companies don't, if they're slow, like they're getting out of the gate, slow, like ramping a product, they don't go in and 
increase their price. They they go and increase their price if on it for supply, if they have a long term issue, if they have like a 12 to 26 week issue, then I'm like, all right, I got to do something with demand. Otherwise, people are going to start getting pissed off. But if you're just like slow getting started and you've already ramped this same bomb, basically, in um, in China, that's not a reason to raise prices. I'm um, I'm again, I'm bullish, but I mean, I just I'm thinking of it logically. If I was inside of this operation as well, I'm going to increase price if my order book is starting to you know become a problem. Uh, that and that's what I that's why I would do it. Um, but anyway, it, it's debatable. But it's good to see. These are small movements, by the way, too, relatively. But yeah. still, Omar, what's the likelihood that when they? Uh, it looks like there's a lot of signals that they're going to allow FSD in China and Europe. All sorts of, you know, it's in the code. There's uh, some laws that have been changed. If when they are they waiting for FSD version 12, or do you think that they would roll out 11 first, or maybe they won't do FSD in China and Europe? What's what's your thinking there? Yeah, I think it's going to be version 12. That's the first version to ship internationally. And I think it's going to completely blow their socks off their feet. These are people who are using legacy autopilot from four or five years ago. I want you to imagine autopilot hasn't been updated in four or five years. It's still that thing that centers in the lane line instead of the thing that's making turns and, you know, driving around sometimes curb to curb without any intervention. So their jaw is literally going to fall to the floor when they see what's been going on behind the scenes and they try version 12. I mean, even people in the United States, I think, are going to be shocked. So it's going to be a really incredible moment. It's going to be like a chat GPT moment when people go, oh, my God, you got to go hit the subscribe button and try this thing. It's fucking crazy. Your car just literally starts driving itself. So that's going to be a fun yeah. moment that's going to happen for sure. But I think the other thing that people aren't appreciating is Tesla has a really good lineup of vehicles this year. They updated the Model 3. They got the Cybertruck. The Model Y is just like this incredible value car now. And I mean, the Model S and X are incredible too. I just bought a Model S. So these new vehicles, they're really great. During the pandemic, they didn't really introduce as many changes. They kind of paused new vehicles for a while. And, well, the pandemic's over, and we've got these all-new vehicles. So I think people, when they just are seeing these, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of people order Teslas and take delivery. It's kind of exciting. What what is it that you've seen in twelve that really is the thing that shocked you? Is it that the, for the very first time this new version is able to navigate out of your your, you know, the gates that you always had to wait? Is there something like that, or uh, just like I think you've been always saying the smoothness of the drive? Is that the thing that makes you more excited? Well, you know, for years and I've been testing FSD for more than three years. For years, we get new updates. And there's certain problems. And you get the new update, it still has the problem. You get another update, maybe it got a little bit better, but the problem's still there. These same fundamental problems persisting for years and years. And yeah, maybe you can have some good drives, but why is this problem never getting fixed for three years? And then suddenly you get version 12, and a bunch of those problems are just gone. It just works. And you're like, holy shit, we were doing it entirely wrong this whole time. This is the way forward. So there's just a long list of things, but more than anything, it's comfortable. It doesn't do those robotic maneuvers where it's jerking back and forth. It's natural. It's comfortable. It doesn't like suddenly jerk to the right for no reason or jerk to the left for no reason. It just drives like a human. So yeah, this is really what we've been waiting for. And they've been working on this since December 2022. So we were kind of looking at 11 and going, huh, doesn't feel like it's making that much progress. But secretly, they were working on a complete rewrite. And that's what's ready to roll out this quarter, maybe even in, you know, very soon.
Well, some people are pointing to when Elon said unsupervised or supervised driving is three times more. And people are going, how come he said supervised driving? He's he's no longer talking about FSD. And that's why they thought that he's backpedaling on um, the, the value of FSD version 12. Yeah, people say a lot of stupid things. Where were you earlier? Okay, who's going to speak after that? Sawyer, do you want to say something stupid? <laughs> I've said all my stupid things earlier. I'm going to say mine for later. Yeah, I'm, t I'm tapped out too. Okay. Well, no, I appreciate it. Sawyer and Omar, thank you for joining, but you guys came a little late. I appreciate it. This is now running close to three hours. And so let's go ahead and uh, go for dinner, everybody. But thank you guys very much. This is Cyber Bulls. Follow the Cyber Bulls uh, speaker there and everybody on the, on the board. Thank you so much. We do it every week. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.